be a talent running here, a little bit like me, but he's got a little bit of a sharper chin, which he calls. So, better looking guy. No, well, I, I wouldn't uh, call it that. I didn't say nothing. Boy, huh. look at that. Yeah. A
Hello, hi, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent. Okay. So I think yesterday was really different. I really enjoyed the tubercles topic. Tubercles topic. Uh, I mean, just amazing to learn so many things about it also. So coming from the uh, will today's topic, we've got one minute to go. So I'll wait. Start. Because you on this, uh, you on this group? Yes, sir. Are you there? Yes, sir. Okay. What I'll do because is I, I will, I will pass on the. Uh, uh, I'll make you the host of this. Is that okay? So okay, that sir. I don't get disturbed during the thing. So let me Anyone just. Anyone is uh, trying to log in, I will just allow. Okay. Yeah, I've actually removed that uh, that. Uh, the login control so anybody can log in but uh, if there's any issues you just take over the uh, meeting either you or shilpa if shilpa is on there as well okay yeah i'm there uh, oh you're there good, good. Mm -hmm. okay 
So either you or Shilpa just take over the thing in mm-hmm. case my connection goes off or something. Anyone? Uh, I will just try and make you guys the host. I'm just mm-hmm. trying to work out where it is. Can't see. It. Okay. All right. So let me first start recording. Most important, record on the circuit. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another session of uh, the Thoracic Gurus. Uh, we've been having uh, phenomenal uh, lectures over the last week, and uh, really some very, very powerful speakers have been speaking on this platform. Uh, and uh, today I'll try and address the topic of thoracic trauma. Now, my aim uh, of doing this lecture is purely uh, for the exam going people. Uh, so a lot of it may be a bit of theory. Uh, that is because I tried to cover all the possible questions that could be asked in the exam of a candidate, particularly when we're talking about trauma. Now, I know all of you guys do see a lot of trauma and are pretty experienced in the management, but uh, having everything organized into a one lecture will also give you a reference point uh, when you want to go back and study for the exam. So I, ha- I was fortunate enough uh, to work for uh, almost seven, eight years uh, in Medanta, the Medicity. Uh, Medanta, the Medicity, as you know, lies on the Gurgaon uh, Jaipur Highway, the Delhi Jaipur Highway. So we had a huge amount of trauma, uh, 300 miles on either side, uh, coming to uh, Medicity, and hence we we were pretty exposed to all these high impact traumas. In addition to that, of course, uh, living in Gurgaon had its own pleasure uh, because we had the Gurgaon Mafia, and uh, every. Every so often, we used to get these shootouts uh, uh, over property issues, and uh, some of them were uh, high-powered uh, weapons. But most of the times, the shootout would be with local, uh, locally made guns called as the katta. So this this impact of 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 a katta versus a high-powered gun actually makes a difference when you are managing the patient. So it's very important to know what was the weapon which was used. And of course, driving in India is great. Uh, Gurgaon is particularly uh, good because we have all these uh, uh, rich uh, local guys uh, driving all these high expensive uh, Hummers and uh, the Scorpios and etc. all these big vehicles. Uh, everybody thinks that they own the road and uh, NH8 is actually called as the killer highway. So a uh, huge number of accidents happen on the NH8 and uh, it, hence it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the perfect place to learn about uh, you know, uh, thoracic trauma. Uh, and I think this is how the sign should be you know, uh, on the highway. Uh, because unfortunately with thoracic trauma, a huge number of patients do not actually make it to the uh, A&E department. Uh, they unfortunately die on the spot. So chest trauma accounts for 25% of all trauma deaths, and that's the statistics uh, around the world. And uh, the important thing is one third of them will die on the spot, okay? And two third of them after coming to hospital may actually die. So really the ones that we can save, uh, we, they can only be saved if we follow protocolized medicine. And that is the whole purpose of this talk today is to try to put the context of management of trauma into a protocol so that you understand next time you see a trauma patient, uh, you know, what is the protocol? How should you go about doing things? So the important thing to remember in thoracic trauma is what are the physiological causes of them? And the fourth, the three things that come to mind are tissue hypoxia, hypercarbia, and metabolic acidosis. The patients who are involved with trauma, unfortunately die because we are not able to address these three issues. What causes tissue hypoxia? Hypovolemia, which is shock, ventilation perfusion mismatch, secondary to pulmonary contusions, or loss of negative intrathoracic pressure, secondary to a open uh, pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax, uh, and uh, the other causes are hypercarbia, which could be secondary to inadequate ventilation, 
and depressed level of consciousness. Again, remember each slide is designed as a question with answers at the bottom. So everything that I'm saying is actually what is will be asked to you in an exam. So just keep track of what I'm saying. Try to take some notes, it will help you. The third thing that I said, which causes physiological death in uh, chest trauma is metabolic acidosis. And metabolic acidosis can be due to shock and shock can be of the various types, a hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock or neurogenic shock. And all of these as a physiological response to trauma, you will get metabolic acidosis because of the crush injury, because of uh, shutdown of uh, various uh, uh, organs in the body, you get lactic acidosis and eventually you will end up with metabolic acidosis. So it's quite important to understand that each of the three that I told you are actually facts that we can address. So it is important to understand what is the cause of death. And if we can address the underlying cause of death, we may be able to actually save lives. So my lecture today is designed in two phases. The first phase is out of hospital management, which is management at the site of the trauma. And then the second phase is in hospital management, which is management in the ER or management uh, in the wards once the patient comes up to you, okay? So let's look at out of hospital management strategies. For trauma care to be really successful, uh, uh, the important thing to remember is trauma should be addressed at three levels. One is pre-event, one is at the event, and the third one is post-event. So these, when you want to educate the general population about management of trauma, you actually have to address factors which will prevent the event, factors at the event, and what you do after the event. So let's look at what are the factors that need to be addressed pre-event when you want to take care of it. So pre-event is of course public education, yeah. Uh, workplace safety, uh, use of protective equipments and things like that. Uh, following speed limits, it's extremely vital that we educate the, gen, uh, the mass population in uh, following speed limits. A conflict resolution without violence. This is very, very important. Uh, you know, uh, road rage is a very big issue in India and in lots of parts of the world. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, road rage can uh, result in either a, a crash into another car or B, use of conflict we weapons. So use of guns, knives and things like that. So this education is quite important. Uh, motorcycle helmet usage is absolutely mandatory. And this is government strategy to prevent uh, death from trauma, prevention of drunk driving, and use of child safety seats. And these are all points which we very often discuss uh, with candidates when we are discussing, how would you bring down the trauma deaths in your country? This is how the question is asked. And uh, this is how you have to reply back, talking about uh, education, talking about various uh, things that uh, will actually directly impact death from trauma. And each one of these which I'm mentioning is actually backed by literature. So every single point which I've mentioned on this slide is backed by literature. And literature has shown that the moment the government or the employer or uh, general public start using these uh, measures, uh, the death from trauma actually goes down. So it's quite important to understand these things. What about the event? Uh, at the event, uh, very often it's lives can be saved if you've got good ambulance crew. And paramedic crew education is absolutely important. It's vital to save lives. Uh, not only paramedic crew education, but driving education for the paramedic crew is equally important because we have looked at the literature and there are a number of accidents which happen because an ambulance is responding to a medical emergency. So that is, uh, that is something that can, is completely avoidable. So uh, safe driving by the paramedic crew is very much part of a trauma protocol and trauma education. At the site of the event, the paramedic needs to know how to stabilize the patient. They, they need to know the use of cervical collar because cervical collars uh, have a direct impact on uh, 
uh, progression of disease or uh, you know c spine injuries uh, becoming unstable so stabilization of a c spine with cervical collar is a huge uh, impact on outcomes of trauma a uh, use of a spinal board correct use of a spinal board not just use of a spinal board but correct use of a spinal board uh, the a b c d e which i'll talk in great detail as i go along and the ability to perform emergency bilateral thoracotomy now this actually this uh, slide which i have put out to you comes from the uh, paramedic association of the of uk and in the united kingdom the paramedics are highly highly trained to a point that they can also do bilateral anter anterior thoracotomies at the trauma site there are many many times in the uk when i have received patients where the paramedic actually did a bilateral anterior thoracotomy maybe he suspected tension pneumothorax or something else or he wanted to do an open cardiac massage and they would actually bring the patient in with open chest on both sides and these were major traumas because in uk the speed limits are uh, pretty high our um, our uh, highways motorways as they are called Uh, are are very wide and uh, cars drive on them at pretty fast speed the official speed limit is 70 miles per hour which is i think around 100 kilometers an hour and when an accident happens on the uh, motorways it's usually a pretty serious event and very often uh, the emergency crew at the site will actually already do a bilateral thoracotomy just to let out a tension pneumothorax so this is uh, an important uh, factor which you must know in your management of trauma so and post event so we've spoken about pre event we've spoken about the event and we're going to speak about post event a uh, post event the mortality is happen because of fatal injuries to great vessels heart and brain uh, and early death can happen within minutes to hours and so the golden hour is very very important and understanding of the concept of the golden hour is very important to save lives uh, most of the mortality will happen because of insufficient ventilation impaired oxygenation cardiovascular compromise failed end organ perfusion and massive brain injury and at least the first three which i mentioned out of this insufficient ventilation impaired oxygenation and cardiovascular compromise can be addressed by the treating team uh, provided they know what to do how to do and everybody follows a similar protocol okay so we come to a concept called as pre hospital trauma life support this is an international concept uh, phtls everybody knows about atls but in the exam when i ask you about phtls everybody gives me a blank look as if they have never heard this word actually phtls is a very standardized protocol which is followed by uh, by all trauma crew uh, certainly in the western world uh, the ambulance and the uh, air ambulance crew follow this quite a lot and there are three important philosophies of the phtls uh, uh, concept the first thing is to actually recognize life threatening injury which means a triage the triage is very very important at the site of the trauma the second thing is to start sufficient supportive therapy okay and the third principle is to transfer the patient to the appropriate facility where he can get definitive therapy so for that you need a network of all hospitals where you know that if somebody's got neurosurgery is better to transfer him to you know say deriford if it's on m m5 uh motorway uh, motorway 5 or uh, if he's got some other injury then transfer him to birmingham uh, or if he's got some other injury transfer him to uh, london so this concept of phtls works very strongly when the whole network is very well organized and everybody understand similar things are in different countries uh, us has similar policies europe follows similar policies unfortunately in india this is not uh, so strong uh Uh, at least uh, up to now the phtls is where uh, the india Ind indian uh, healthcare falls short we have very very good hospitals but the ambulance procedure to 
pick up the patient, give supportive therapy, and to take him to a proper hospital which will give the correct care is unfortunately lacking in India. And that is why the mortality from trauma becomes very high if your PHTLS is not well established. It is quite important to understand this concept. So let's look at out of hospital therapy. So what is the initial therapy that you want to do? Most important is to understand the concept of golden hour. Every minute lost directly correlates with increased mortality. There is meta-analysis on this, not just uh, papers, but there is meta-analysis on this, which has looked at the impact of the golden hour. And that is why the PHTLS is very important because by the time you transfer the patient to the tertiary care hospital, you've already lost a lot of time. And if you do not start therapy within the first uh, few minutes of reaching the site, then you're likely to miss, uh, you're likely to lose patients. So out of hospital initial therapy starts with a scene assessment. And the scene assessment looks at safety situation. And I'll talk about each one of these Hello? in more detail. Uh, switch off your microphone, you everybody. Uh, sorry, just one second. Okay. So the out of microphone. hospital. Hi, can you hear me now? Is my microphone on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, out of hospital, as I said, initial therapy starts with a scene assessment, particularly looking at safety and situation. And I'll talk about these two in a minute. Okay. Next is patient assessment and triage. So, you don't first jump into the patient. First, you look at the safety of the personnel. The ambulance personnel, you look at the safety of the patient, and more importantly, you look at the safety of the bystander. These are the three things that you have to assess. Then you start assessing, uh, you do a triage of the patient. So it could be one patient or it could be 10 patients in a bus, or you could be in a bomb blast site where there could be 100 patients. So triage suddenly becomes very important so that you don't waste time from a golden hour. Then starts the initial evaluation and management of the patient. So triage, then you start treating the patient. And most importantly is the communication. After you have started the initial evaluation or at the same time as you started the initial evaluation, the information has to be relayed back to the appropriate treating, uh, uh, treating hospital. So in most hospitals in the Western world, we actually have a trauma coordinator in every hospital. So the moment the ambulance service gets the first call of a, of, to reach out to a uh, trauma setting, they actually call in to the trauma coordinator. The co trauma coordinator starts activating the a &E protocol. We have a fixed protocol. And so the trauma coordinator starts activating the a &E protocol. As soon as the ambulance reaches the site, the person in the ambulance, one person will actually call back or they are having a continuous conversation. They will keep updating the a &E to make sure that the a &E is prepared for the seriousness of the trauma. So here we are not talking of just one patient. We could be in a casualty situation. We could be in a disaster. So all this has to be transferred back to the uh, backing hospital to the tertiary hospital so that they can start preparing for receiving the patient. So information is very, very important when you want to save people's lives. Okay. Let's look at scene assessment. So each one of this will go by one by one. So scene assessment. First and foremost is the safety of the medical personnel. The person who's reaching out there should not die because he's got involved with a trauma because there could be burns, there could be fire, there could be electrical hazards. There are a lot of things that you have to look at. So first is the safety of the medical personnel. Second is the safety of the patient. The third, as I told you, is the safety of the bystander. Okay. 
and the safety is from all of these things fire electrical lines presence of explosives presence of weapons blood or body fluids you don't want to come in contact with blood or body fluids of the patient because you don't know the status of any of these patients so out of hospital care starts with an a scene assessment okay that's the first thing once you've done that then it is a situation assessment the situation assessment the questions that have to be asked are what happened that's first what was the mechanism of injury how many people are involved what is the age group of the trauma victims because the treatment of pediatrics as opposed to treatment of the geriatric is is different and and if in that group there is a pregnant person the treatment changes so you need to be a certain very quickly what is the age group of the people involved is there a need for air ambulance you have to do triage if it's a major disaster and i'll talk about triage in more detail additional resources that you need either on site and also informing the tertiary hospital about what may be needed and medical cause of accidents so you know sometimes some accidents happen because the person may be involved may have had an epileptic fit or may have had an mi so you've got to assess that on the spot the ambulance crew assesses that and then it will relay back to the uh, tertiary hospital so not only do you have to treat for the effects of the trauma but you also should be ready for treating the cause of the trauma so this situation assessment is protocolized and it is very important people must understand this and particularly when you are writing a question a, a, a long question in a, in a theory paper this all must be laid out in the way i have presented to you this is all from guidelines okay this is from the papers of trauma all right now let's look at triage now there are two types of triage okay always remember there are two triages one triage is done at the site of the accident and the second triage is done in the ani okay so i'll show you the difference between the two triages it's quite important to understand the difference between the two triages so at the at the site of the accident the first triage has to look at what is immediately recoverable who are the people who will live that is the most important thing okay the the condition where if i do a treatment the patient's life will be saved and that is why uh, tension pneumothorax features in this because all you need to do is put in a needle and that is why the ambulance crew in the western world are taught how to do bilateral thoracotomies because these are immediately immediately people's lives can be saved so that is the first point that they look whenever they have got a group of 10 20 30 people first thing they will see is who is the person whom i can recover immediately and i'll get the best recovery that's number one then comes the ones who can wait so delayed these are the long bone fractures you don't need to jump in and try and treat the long bone fracture straight away okay then comes the minor injuries the walking wounded as we call them okay it's very important within the triage to identify who are the people who have the least chance of survival and this this experience is very important for the ambulance crew because there's no point in wasting your time trying to save somebody who's got a massive uh, rupture uh, of of an aorta or an abdominal thing of course you cannot make it out from outside but the physiological status of the patient may give you a good indication of whether he's got a good chance of surviving or not a good chance of surviving so there's no point wasting the golden hour on a patient who's got least chance of survival and ignoring the guy with the tension pneumothorax so this triage is crucial and last but not the least understanding who is dead or who is unresponsive because you have limited resources limited people if you've got more than one person in the trauma scenario who's injured then you need to concentrate all your effort on the immediate 
on the immediate ones. That is the most important thing. And that is why this concept of triage is very important. It works in the reverse way. It works in the best recovery is treated first and the dead are completely ignored at the time of the accident. Okay, all right. And then most important is as you are proceeding with your treatment at the site, as you are looking at each patient and sorting things out, one team leader has to re-triage because things can change. Somebody whom you thought could be saved may die. So there's no point wasting time with that death. Move on to the next guy who you have the best chance of saving. So this triage at the site of the trauma is very, very, very important. And re-triage, every few minutes, the triage should continue. And it is all in the hands of the team leader who's supposed to lead this triage, okay? This is very important and you must understand this concept of triage. We'll talk about the triage in the a &E when we reach that point. At the moment, we are still at the accident site. So in trauma, what are the life-threatening conditions, okay? Where can people die and where you can intervene and save lives? The first and foremost is compromised airway, okay? Very important and we'll talk about airway in a lot more detail. Interrupted ventilation. So people with hypoxia, tension, open pneumothorax, flail chest, okay? Hemorrhage, people who are bleeding, you can actually physically stop the bleeding or if somebody's got a long bone fracture and he's likely to lose a lot of volume, you can physically just put a strapping on the long bone. So these are all people you can save lives, okay? People with an abnormal neurological status, penetrating trauma, that's a completely different kettle of fish and we will discuss penetrating trauma as a separate topic altogether. People with amputation or near amputations. So these are very important to understand. Uh, also the elderly patients, people with comorbidities, somebody with coronary artery disease, somebody with coagulopathy, uh, hypothermia. Hypothermia needs to be addressed very quickly at the site of the trauma. Because a lot of people, there is a lot of evidence which shows that if the temperature of the body drops below a certain point, it is directly correlated with mortality. Okay, this is, there are many papers out there which have looked at hypothermia. So a simple act of putting a silver sheet around the patient's chest and the body may actually save the patient's life or getting him into a warm ambulance may save a patient's life. Uh, elderly are more at risk of trauma, of death from trauma. Burns are more at risk because they will have inhalational injuries and they will have uh, oropharyngeal uh, burns. And people with pregnancies uh, are, are more at risk. And here you have got two problems. One is you've got to save the mother and you've also got to save the child. So it is a completely different situation when you manage that. So what are the skills that you need at the site to be able to manage a patient of trauma? First is manual clearing of an airway. Everybody must learn to do it. You must know how to do it and I'll talk about it. The various maneuvers, that is the trauma jaw thrust maneuver, the trauma chin lift maneuver, suctioning of the oropharyngeal airway, use of oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airways, and endotracheal intubation. Okay, all of this directly address the airway because A, B, C, D, E, the first is A, airway and you must know how to manage each of these. So there is two types of chin lift maneuvers. This is the basic chin lift maneuver, which is called as a one person chin lift maneuver, where one hand is stabilizing the head and the other hand is lifting the chin upwards. Look at the direction of the lift, okay? That's quite important because what you're trying to do is lift the tongue away from the airway. You're trying to lift the tongue anteriorly upwards so that the airway opens up. The second one is called as a two-person chin lift. A two-person chin lift is usually done when you also are suspecting uh, C-spine injuries, okay? When you're thinking that this guy may have some cervical spine injury, then one person stabilizes the head and the neck, and then the second person opens the mouth, puts a thumb into the mouth and lifts up the chin to enable clearing the airway and to enable suctioning 
and to enable insertion of an oropharyngeal airway. The jaw thrust is very, very important. Everybody, at least in the UK, who work with traumas have to have done ACLS, ATLS, and BCLS. And uh, this is a mandatory requirement uh, in the UK for you to see a trauma patient. And jaw thrust is very much part of that, uh, of that uh, treatment. So everybody must learn how to do a jaw thrust and lift up the whole jaw of the patient. And one time in your life, you, will, you may be able to save a patient's life because you could do a good jaw thrust. It is a technique you have to learn. It doesn't come just randomly looking at pictures. So we, we do courses where we are taught all these things uh, to save people's lives. Uh, there is something called as a head tilt. So you push the head back, but again, only in patients who have got no cervical spine injuries. Very important, okay? Do not do head tilt in people who are suspected C-spine injury. You will aggravate the spinal injury and a person who was not paraplegic may become paraplegic. So be very, very careful in your assessment before you do anything like that. Oropharyngeal airways are extremely important and whenever you go to outreach or whenever you go to a trauma site, you must have all ranges of oropharyngeal airways. So right from the pediatric to the adult full size, all ranges have to be there in a single box. It is called as the airway box and everything has to be in that. And all sizes have to be available. You cannot just go out there with one size because there could be a child there and there's no point putting in an adult size into that. In addition to that, uh, the way you size the airway is you place it outside from the lip to the angle of the jaw. So a correct size airway is one that reaches the angle of the jaw. If it is falling short, it is no good because really the airway has to go beyond the collapsed tongue. That is the most important factor in saving the life of the patient. So it has to be beyond this angle of the jaw. And that is the air, correct size of the airway. And the way to place it is, is you open the jaw with your fingers and it goes in and it rotates 180 degrees. So you got to enter it with the curve facing the hard palate and then as you advance, you have to turn it 180 degrees and it has to go beyond the tongue. The key thing is beyond the tongue because what you're trying to do with the airway is establish a connection with outside air to the airway because the tongue is the one which causes most, the tongue and the soft palate are the ones which cause the asphyxia because the tongue collapses and the soft palate uh, falls in and you cannot breathe. So it's very important to learn how to place an airway. Very, very, very important. In addition to that, you can have these newer types of airways which are open on the side. And the advantage of this open type of airway is it allows suctioning. Okay, when you've got open airway, you can very nicely suction the, uh, suction the uh, oropharyngeal cavity. So these are special airways that are available for oropharyngeal suctioning, okay? Don't forget the nasopharyngeal airway. Nasopharyngeal airway are very important when you have got uh, facial injuries, when you've got a uh, fracture of the uh, mandible, when you've got uh, oropharyngeal injuries, then the access to the airway can be achieved with nasopharyngeal airway. And nasopharyngeal airways, again, come in a whole series of sizes and you must in your airway box have all of them, okay? There is no compromise on that. You must have all of them. These are longer than oropharyngeal airways because they have to go across the nasal turbinates and go behind into the airway. So these are slightly longer. And uh, the manipulation of, the, of this nasopharyngeal airway is according to the curve of the nasopharyngeal pathway. So it is important. You have to practice these in dummies. It's mandatory. If you are going to ever see a trauma patient, you must know how to put in a nasopharyngeal airway. Cervical collars are very important. Again, we all have courses and we are taught how to put in a cervical collar. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but there is a whole 
if I was you, I would look at the videos. There are lots of videos available on YouTube as well. Please, please, if you're ever going to see a trauma patient, you must know what is the way to put in a cervical collar without destabilizing the spine. It's absolutely mandatory. Every single person should know this. And again, cervical collars come in various sizes and you must know how to size a cervical collar when you are going to be going to a trauma site. Spinal board immobilization is very important. Uh, most of the patients in a major trauma in the UK are actually immobilized on a spinal board before they are moved into the ambulance. This is mandatory. We never move a patient uh, onto a trolley until and unless he's fixed on the spinal board. And there is lots and lots and lots of papers which have looked at this. And every single one of them has suggested that use of spinal boards saves lives because you may you will not aggravate a patient's vertebral, spinal, or C-spine injury if you fix the patient to a spinal board before you move him into the ambulance. Also, rolling the patient onto the spinal board is a technique for which you have to undergo training. It's not just lift the patient, push the spinal board, put him up. There is a specific sequence of events that you have to do when you move a spinal board underneath a patient. And there's a specific way to fix a patient to a spinal board. Okay. What are the backups for intubation? You have options of double lumen tube. You have options of laryngeal mass, laryngeal tube, or you have transtracheal ventilation. So normal intubation, you know, you put in a, a single lumen tube. But I'll talk about the laryngeal mask and laryngeal tubes and transtracheal ventilation. Okay, so there are various types of laryngeal tubes that are available. And these are actually extremely good when you do not have an experienced anesthetist at the site of the trauma who are experienced in intubating uh, the patient with a single human tube, because that needs yeah. some experience. A laryngeal tube is much more easier to pass and more likely to end in a proper anatomical position, even without experience of bypassing the cord. That is why laryngeal tubes are highly recommended. Uh, yeah, whoever is on the line on the lecture, now please switch off your phone. I could have made this into a into a webinar, but then it doesn't, we, we cannot interact with each other, but then we need discipline from the audience to switch off the phone so that the speaker doesn't get disturbed, okay? All right, so we were talking about laryngeal tubes. So laryngeal tubes are many types and I've, I'm bringing this to the table because I think many of our surgical colleagues are not even aware of what are the types of laryngeal tubes that are present. So I have bought this laryngeal tube and I'll show you all the laryngeal tubes that are available, okay? Each one of them has certain benefits over the other. We as, as surgeons don't need to know the details of this, but we just need to be, we need to be aware what are the types of laryngeal tubes that are available. So, so the first one is classic, which was the first generation airway and it's in, in, inserted in, it lies on top of the uh, pharynx onto the uh, airway and you can directly, uh, you can uh, ventilate the patient. It has got a nice inflation cuff, which increases and gives you, uh, um, gives you a closure of that area so that all air can be directed into the airway. And these are all soft cuffs. They are designed to minimize trauma for the patient. And then you've got further tubes which allow you to suction and things like that. So laryngeal LMA classic is the first type. The other types that are available is flexible LMA. This is got uh, this has got wires, reinforced wires in it, and this works very well when you are dealing with the uh, maxillofacial traumas and things like that. So these will allow you to bend it in a particular way, and also it has got uh, channels for sec suction and uh, secretion of the blood. So LMA flexible is the next type. The third type is LMA fast track. The LMA fast track has a handle here, which you can hold. And it also gives you, uh, uh, it's got markings on it, which tells you exactly how much depth you need to go. 
and it will uh, it's very good when you are dealing with difficult airways so the fast track has fa fast stretch has further uh, curves uh, which will actually help you to intubate a patient much easier than a normal lma the newer one that is available is the pro seal the pro seal is a reusable one and look at it it has got two channels okay so it's an lma but it has got two channels the first channel gives you a very good seal and allows you to suction but more importantly the second channel gives you access to the esophagus and you can suction out all of the abdominal contents because most of these patients the outcome is 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 deteriorated because they aspirate abdominal contents so this lma pro seal is a good one for using when you are worried about a patient with a full abdomen and then the latest one is the lma supreme which has got a few other features which we don't need to get into all right the the visual lmas are available we have got lma c track which has got a video camera attached to it uh, there are softer mla uh, softer jelly type uh, uh, tubes available which are called as i gel supraglottic airway so these do not uh, close the whole airway but they just allow air to go in there and again they are available in various sizes and then the last but not the least is something called as a basca basca mask uh, this is again used in trauma cases uh, particularly when you want airway uh, access when you want access to suction uh, the airway and when you want access to uh, uh, suction the gastric content so each one of this is separately designed for the various the uh, channels that are available uh, and uh, there is a new concept uh, called as slipper which is streamlined liner of pharyngeal anatomy again these are not uh, laryngeal masses these just lie in the pharynx and uh, the last but not the least is something called as a laryngeal tube so laryngeal tube is something which has got two balloons and one opening and the balloon uh, allows you to seal off the esophagus and selectively uh ventilate just the uh airway so here is the balloon lying in the esophagus so the esophagus gets sealed off and selectively you are ventilating the airway so just for your information i bought all this on the same platform as troma because these are all that are used by the uh troma uh troma people uh and then of course you've got the visual laryngeal devices the whole range of them available we don't need to know know the details but just to know that it's available sometimes you might not be able to get into the airway because of uh, oropharyngeal injury and if that's the case then you get into the cricopharyngeal area and put in a needle and this is a jet insufflator which will actually give you jet ventilation of the uh, of the patient uh, and not damage the uh, not damage the Uh, larynx and the pharynx which is already damaged by trauma so this is a technique which you need to know everybody needs to learn how to be able to put in a needle into the cricopharyngeal membrane so very very important it might save somebody's life particularly when you've got laryngeal edema angioedema or trauma which has collapsed the airway okay so that's about airway okay, okay. Uh, is it making sense to you guys or is it too detailed i'm quite happy to go fast it is going perfect it is good 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 perfect yeah, is it okay because these are things you will never learn yes ever yes. Uh, in, in your uh, curriculum so right. i try to cover as much as possible okay all right uh, okay so now we have done the airway let's look at what are the devices available for us for controlling hemorrhage okay so there are various techniques to control a hemorrhage uh, one is direct pressure to bleeding sites uh, somebody please close off your microphone giri hello yeah hi so controlling hemorrhage is very much part of out of hospital uh, trauma care and it starts with the direct pressure to any bleeding site or you can do pressure dressing over the wound and try to control the bleeding or you can apply tourniquet or you can apply topical hemostatic agents any of this or whatever is available to you you can do it it's surprising when i asked this it looks like a very simple uh, technique all of these 
But when we ask people in, in the exam, you know, how do you control hemorrhage in a patient? And people can't even give you the basic answers. So that's why I have put these in point wise so that in the exam, you're able to reproduce it uh, fairly easily, okay? These are, the, uh, uh, these are the charts that are available for bleeding control. Uh, and, and each technique is well described how to do each one of them, pressure gaze, pressure, gaze, pressure dressing and stuff like that. Uh, and almost all of us in the a &E have these charts available where they, they, they demonstrate to you how each one of these can be done to stop bleeding. And it's very important to know this because you might be able to save somebody's life because hypovolemia kills a lot of patients. In addition to these basic techniques, the other methods of controlling hemorrhage are uh, making sure that the patient doesn't get hypothermic. That's part of hemorrhage control because the moment the patient becomes hypothermic, the bleeding exacerbates, the shock exacerbates. So thermostasis is almost a part of controlling hemorrhage. So you have to make sure that the patient's got warming blankets and the ambulance is warm enough you know, the temperature in the ambulance has been maintained when the patient gets in there. Uh, splinting musculoskeletal injuries, again, is a very important part of hemorrhage control because, as you all know, a long bone fracture can lose a liter and can continue to bleed within the muscle chamber. So it's very, very important to splint any suspected fractures at the site of the trauma. And the third one is use of pneumatic anti-shock garments, okay? And there's something I'll tell you about. This is used predominantly when you're trying to control pelvic, intraperitoneal, or retroperitoneal bleeding. But the problem with a pneumatic anti-shock garment is you cannot use it in pregnant patient because then you are applying direct pressure onto the baby and you will lose the baby. So very important to assess very early whether the patient is pregnant or not before you use a pneumatic anti-shock uh, uh, garment. So this is how it looks. And it has got all numbers on it. So when you lock it, you're supposed to lock it from distal to proximal. If you lock from proximal to distal, you will actually keep losing more volume. So always when you lay, the patient, lay this below the patient, the closure is, is brightly numbered. You cannot make a mistake in this. So you start with the distal, then number two, then number three, then number four, and this one comes on the abdomen. So this is the pelvic bar. This is the long bones for the thigh. This is near the knee, and this is at the calf, okay? So each one of this has a specific location, and you got to know how to use this. And this is how you close it. Can you see that? So it's very, very well organized. So one, two, three, four, and five. It's all well labeled, and you have to know how to use a pressure garment when you're trying to control bleeding. In pregnant patients, as I told you, uh, you cannot apply too much pressure. So there are specific devices available which are non-pneumatic. So you cannot actually inflate air and cause a pneumatic compression of this uh, device. Uh, so this is specifically designed for pregnant people, particularly on the pelvis and the abdomen. You cannot uh, inflate the pressure and cause a non uh, uh, a compromise of the fetus. Hence, these devices are also available. See, if you look carefully, it's called a non-pneumatic anti-shock uh, uh, garment. So these will give pressure, but not uh, exaggerated pressure. So they will, the, the way they're designed is to make sure that the fetus is safe, okay? There are certain contraindications to pressure uh, uh, devices, and we said that penetrating chest traumas, you should not use pressure uh, supports. Evisceration of abdominal contents, impaled objects, you cannot use that because the object is in your way. Pregnant patient, more important, okay? And traumatic cardiorespiratory. If a patient is arrested, you, you should not be using uh, these devices. You actually have to start uh, resuscitating the patient. So this, this is again uh, from now, uh, one of the MCQs, okay? So contraindications to using pressure devices in trauma. That is the question that's asked. And you need to know these five points and you should be able to come out with these five points, okay? All right. So far, so good. Is it all clear? Yes, sir. 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 Yes. Okay. So let's it, look at another yes, category. Let's look at another category of injuries called as blast injuries. This, I promise you, 
is asked in the exam. Okay, if there's a trauma discussion happening and it's going deeper and deeper, then it comes to blast injuries, and you need to understand mechanisms of blast injuries. This is simple Bailey and Love stuff, but you have to understand it. You must know it. So there are various uh, various things that are generated, and each one of them has a different impact on the human body. So when the blast happens, the first and foremost thing that comes is called as a blast wave, where the compressed air particles suddenly rupture and they go outwards. And so the first injury or the primary injury in a bomb blast is starts with the blast wave. That is the first mode of injury, primary injury. Then there is a shock wave from the blast wave these are the blast waves are carried out to the peripheries by shock waves. And the shock waves carry the energy from the center of the blast. So whatever is the compressed energy, that energy is carried by the shock wave through to the periphery. And the problem with that, it, it also carries sharpness. And so the second mode of injury can be through either energy injury or sharpness that will hit the patient. Then there is something called as blast wind. The blast wind is the, is the wind that occurs from the blast wave to the periphery. So the shock wave is a wave which carries the energy, but the wind is the actual wind that goes out from a blast to the periphery. That can again carry all the sharpness and cause secondary injury. The thing with this is when the wind blows to the side, it creates a vacuum in the center where the blast happens. And so there is a re return of air into the primary site and that is, will cause primary blast injury. So did you understand this concept? So at the point where the blast happened, the wave gets generated, compressed air gets released into the, into the uh, atmosphere. The shock wave carries the energy to the periphery along with the blast wind. And because the wind is moving away in the center of the blast, there is a vacuum created. So the wind will turn around. Some of the wind will turn around and get back into the vacuum. And that will cause more injury because of the sharpness coming back into the site of the blast. So you have three types of injury. You have primary blast injury, you have secondary blast injury, and you have tertiary blast injury, okay? Now I'll show you a picture of it so you'll understand exactly what I was saying. So this is what happens when the blast happens, there's compressed air particles and there's a generation of the shock waves, the shock waves go out, the sharpness are carried along with them by the, uh, by the, uh, by the uh, shock waves. Uh, there will be associated fires and heat that has to be taken care of which can again cause further secondary fires and explosions. And then you have the blast wind, which will go to the periphery. But the vacuum which is created in the center, the sharpness will be pulled back. The blue arrows are the vacuum which is pulling the sharpness back into the center. And that will injure the patient a second time. Or anybody who's not injured by the primary blast will get injured by the vacuum and the blast wind which comes back into the, uh, into the trauma site. So this is how it looks. Here is the primary side. Look at the bottom here, the primary blast mechanism, blast wave causing the injuries. Then the missile effect as we call it, or the shock waves as it call it. And that will carry all these fibers cause, causing secondary injuries. And then the wind will bring it back in. The sharpness are being pulled back in secondary to the vacuum created and that will cause tertiary injuries. And of course, when you hit stationary uh, objects, that is also tertiary injury. So tertiary injury can happen when you hit stationary objects out here. Okay, very important to understand this philosophy of what happens in a blast injury, okay? Because uh, treatment then decides uh, on what you do. Okay, so this is all about the trauma. Now let's look, look at the management of these patients. Okay, what are we doing? So once they have, uh, this is not out of hospital, this is in hospital management. I'm sorry about this. I forgot to put in hospital. So once you've done all of that, now you've brought the patient to the hospital. What is the key thing? The key thing 
in saving people's lives is communication okay communication 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 whatever has happened at the site has to be communicated to the tertiary hospital they must know what exactly is happening what is to be expected are they expecting more burn patients are they expecting more crush injured is absolutely vital because the number of ventilators available will change depending on the number of patients that are coming whether patients have inhalation burns etc 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 so in hospital management is very important communication is very important so that's the first point always put in when you talk about in hospital management the communication with the site of the trauma is very important and then once the patient has come into the trauma you have to do a triage that's a different triage that is based on the canadian triage t system okay then information transfer the patient who has come in there must be adequate information along with the patient to tell what treatment he got by the trauma team at the site and en route what did you do to save this guy how much fluid has been given uh, did you uh, do a bilateral thoracotomy etc etc whatever have you put in a chest tube have you put in a needle things like these have to be transferred the information transfer is very very important to save people's lives so let's look at the canadian triage system this is a t system goes from t1 to t4 okay so now we are going reverse okay now we are looking at immediate life saving patients we are looking at t2 which is patients who can wait for 30 minutes so emergency so you categorize them as t2 the next one is something that needs to be treated within 30 minutes to 1 hour which is called as t3 so there's immediate there's emergency there's urgent and then there's t4 which is delayed so delayed is you can wait 1 to 4 hours and the last is t5 which is expectant which is walking wounded okay walking non urgent patient so this is a second type of triage which is done in the er so whenever a question comes or addressed to you of triage you must not just talk about most people talk about this triage they talk about t1 t2 t3 t4 t5 but they forget about the triage at the site because the triage at the site is more important because the golden hour starts from the point that the accident has happened so the first triage is more important than this triage so it's very very important that you don't bring in a almost dead guy into the ane that is not good use of resources you have to bring in the guy who has highest chance of living and that decision has to be made by the team leader okay now information transfer works on the concept of mist m i s t is very important to know this concept okay now the mist what information you have to give to the ane is mechanism of injury very important you have to talk about suspected injuries so injuries suspected the third thing you have to talk about is vital signs s is for signs vital signs and the fourth is treatment en route these four things are mandatory when you are bringing the patient into the ane or for the trauma team when they are receiving the patient the most important thing is missed you must know these four points before you start treating the patient don't just dump in you must get this information okay now why does a breakdown in care plan happen why why do mortalities increase and this is again a, a paper okay this is from the trauma journal and it's a very important thing to understand because once you understand why you are not getting maximum results in trauma is when you will address the the problem until unless you know the problem you cannot address it so this slide is crucial because it talks about breakdown in care plan the breakdown happens first and foremost is because of communication breakdown because nobody is talking to anybody and you just receive the patient and it's a complete chaos the second thing is failure in situational awareness that is at the site where the guy went in with three people and tried to save three and then two of his own people got injured or he didn't realize that the patient had a c spine injury and did not fix the c spine you understand that so situational awareness is another cause of failure in breakdown plans 
again at the ane there is always this issue of staffing and workload distribution okay and these are very important of course you cannot address it as 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 a single person but management has to address this when we are trying to get maximum results in trauma and last but not the least you'll be surprised how many times in a team when there are unresolved conflicts the team doesn't work well and unfortunately the price for a team not working well is paid for by the patient so unresolved conflicts are very very important the ambulance crew must be in touch with your crew and there should be no fights happening between anybody nobody has got an ego problem there are very clear cut defined uh, lines of hierarchy that is very important in trauma care there has to be a team leader there has to be one person who is going to look after the airway is one person who is going to look after the circulation the breathing the circulation things like that it has to be very clear cut defined and there should be no conflict between uh, members when you are dealing with that otherwise you are you going to land up with a dead patient that's the reality okay so now we come to primary survey okay so a lot of information i have given you which is out of your textbooks this is all from trauma management okay so let's look at primary survey most people start talking from this point onwards but i wanted you to be aware what happens outside in the hospital so all and everybody who's involved with trauma has to be atls certified mandatory and not just certified but you have to be recertified okay so the atls is valid for a certain number of years i think usually 3 years and you've got to redo it whatever is the expiry date of the atls acls uh, and um, my hospital has separate guidelines and none of us will have our annual appraisal pass through until and unless we have done the uh, what is called as stats and mand statutory and mandatory training it is it is part of the gmc guideline you have to have done it before you can even sit for your appraisal for the year so first and foremost is airway but airway doesn't come as airway it also comes with c c spine stabilization stabilization so airway and c spine stabilization go hand in hand so when you talk about abd abcde don't just say airway you have to say airway plus c spine stabilization very important the second is of course breathing third is circulation fourth is disability and the fifth is environment and i'm going to talk about each one of this in a little more detail so what are signs of airway compromise okay one is no response stridor confusion forced reply okay all of these if you have any of these think of airway compromise okay common causes of airway compromise are tongue fall because the tongue has fallen back blood could be collected in the uh, oropharynx vomited so that's why i said uh, it's important to separate the gi the gut from the airway very important it saves lives because aspiration causes that a uh, presence of foreign body in the airway uh, facial or laryngotracheal injuries decreased level of consciousness the patient cannot the it's a central uh, depression of respiration or facial and more importantly inhalational injuries very important you have to always keep inhalational injuries in your repertoire whenever you are thinking of managing an airway because you can't see anything but there could have been burns in the area and the patient took in the hot uh, took in the uh, smoke and that caused inhalational injury need for intubation when do you decide anybody who's got gcs less than 8 when a patient is needing persistent fio2 more than 95% to even maintain oxygenation when the ventilatory rate of the patient or the respiratory rate of the patient has depressed when there is an expanding hematoma in the neck and if there is airway or pulmonary burns very important again i hope you have realized by now that each slide is a question and i'm giving you the answers point wise so you can actually just tell it out in the exam without the need to uh, you know think too much this is all very clear cut very well placed out for you okay protection of airway from aspiration in cases of multi system injury particularly when cns is involved uncooperative behavior you know sometimes some patients may be hypoxic and become very aggressive and not allow you to do what you need to do 
you might actually have to put them under and intubate them purely to be save their own lives or in 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 patients with alcohol or drug intoxication uh, you've got to be you've got to think of you know getting control of the patient's uh, airway by putting him under and putting in an endotracheal tube and last but not the least in children okay if a child is unable to cooperate or you're not sure what is happening and you don't know what to do the best thing is intubate the child and get control of the situation and then try to do your primary secondary tertiary survey okay so very important these are very specific points which have to be reproduced by you uh, it's important to understand malampatti's uh, staging okay whenever you are going to be doing intubations all of us are going to be involved in trauma care all of us as surgeons may be involved in a in a in a respiratory arrest on the ward and you may not have time to have a anesthetist come down so it is important that you 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 look at this malampatti's uh, test which gives you an idea of how easy or how difficult it is to intubate the patient and it goes from class 1 to class 4 uh, okay uh, class 0 is of course the normal one and then the difficulty of intubation is well well classified by the malampatti test okay and then there is the comark and lehans test of the grade of uh, of the glottis okay so th this is difficulty of intubation so grade 1 to grade 4 you must uh, sort of understand have an understanding of what is uh, comark and lehans classification for airway staging okay all right so we've done intubated the guy we've established his breathing pattern we might have connected him to a ventilator and then we look at the circulation that's our next step so two large bore iv cannulas mandatory okay first start two large bore iv cannulas always control hemorrhage very important and i've spoken about the control of hemorrhage all the things that i spoke earlier you can do it in the ane as well uh crystalloid solution where you don't know what is happening where is the source of bleed you just start with the crystalloid solution but very quickly move on to colloids if the patient is uh, requiring more and more support then colloids is what you have to do so gelatin based colloids are better particularly when you have uh, more serious hemorrhage and of course blood transfusion for unstable patients so these are all mechanisms that you use for stabilizing the circulation look at the disability uh, it's very important to have an ongoing uh, neurological assessment you they changes every time within minutes the situation can change so there has to be an ongoing neurological assessment you must expose the patient this is i cannot stress this enough the number of times where i walked in into the ane or the er and i found that the guys are just treating the front of the chest and completely ignoring the back and the main problem could be at the back okay very important to completely take away all the clothing of the patient and put a warming blanket on the patient you don't want the patient to get hypothermic so you put in a warming blanket but all clothes have to be removed a gunshot injury at the front you have to look at the back to make sure that there is no exit wound or if there is an exit wound you are happy that the bullet has gone out if there is no exit wound you know that the bullet is still in the body and you just don't have to look in at the chest you also got to look at the abdomen and the pelvis and the back of the pelvis you will be surprised the number of times that bullets uh, divert it is structure so they can hit a rib and the entry could be in the uh, chest but the exit could be near the pelvis so very 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 important to completely expose the patient and of course make sure that you put warm blankets to avoid hypothermia and heated air or warm fluids all fluids that you put in should be warm so that the patient uh, temperature is maintained uh, hypothermia as i told you directly increases mort mortality of patients so very important to do this okay all right monitoring tubes are very important uh, tpr bp mandatory at least an nibp if not an art line if it's a very serious guy end tidal co2 the moment he is ventilated you need to connect to an end tidal co2 uh, you must put in a urinary catheter for uh, measuring the urinary output be aware of pelvic injuries if somebody has got pelvic injuries please put in a urinary catheter very carefully because he might have rupture of urethra so whenever you are putting in urinary catheters with somebody with pelvic injury if you haven't got enough experience please get an experienced guy or a senior person or a urologist to put in the urinary catheter because your act 
of putting in a urinary catheter can turn an incomplete rupture into a complete rupture because you might force your way through. So very important. And don't forget the, uh, the stomach. Almost always it's good to put in an NG tube to decompress the stomach so that you do not have aspiration into the respiratory uh, mechanism, okay? Now, bloods are very important. They are routine bloods that you do, baseline, CBC, RFT, LFT coagulation. Uh, Cross-match and transfusion is very important. You must immediately send for grouping and cross-matching. Don't forget in the same sample to send for blood alcohol testing. It might be of medical legal importance and also it might help you uh, understand uh, the, the, the non-cooperation of the patient. And the most important is serial ABGs, okay? Serial ABGs give you a good idea of how your patient is progressing. Is he going into metabolic acidosis? Is your treatment helping him? Is the oxygenation coming in or not? So serial ABGs are, are quite important in a trauma patient, okay? And now I have made a little uh, table of all the various, we'll discuss each one of this in more detail, but this is just a snapshot for you to use in your exam to remember, okay? So quickly we'll look at it. Tension pneumothorax, tube thoracostomy. A needle, of course, we understand, but this is just a snapshot. I'll go into details with each one of these. Massive intrathoracic hemorrhage, tube thoracostomy or operative repair, okay? Cardiac tamponade, either pericardiosynthesis or operative repair. Deceleration, aortic injury, usually needs an aortogram and uh, either an endovascular stent or operative repair. Massive flail chest with pulmonary contusions, you need to intubate, you need to get pain control, you, you need to get fluid restriction, make sure that he doesn't overload with fluid. Upper or lower airway obstruction, intubation, airway and bronchoscopy, tracheobronchial rupture, bronchoscopy and operative repair, Diaphragmatic rupture, always operative repair. Any small diaphragmatic injury should be operated. That is the philosophy of a trauma. And esophageal perforation, diagnose it early. It's very difficult to diagnose. Very often missed, but please diagnose it early because if you diagnose early, you get very good outcomes. There are N number of papers which have looked at this and which have uh, suggested that actually primary operative repair of an esophageal rupture gives you the best outcomes. The moment you miss it, then it all becomes infective. And then unfortunately, the outcomes go down dramatically. Okay, so take a snapshot of this and keep this with you all the time. Okay, and now we'll go into various scenarios uh, of the various injuries. But before that, there are two things I need, two or three things I need to address. One is trauma in pediatrics, what you have to be wary of. Uh, volume replacement has to be according to body weight. Okay, so remember small kids are different. Uh, they don't follow the same protocol as adult. Don't just keep pushing in fluids and, uh, you know, uh, make it worse for them. It has to be according to body weight. Uh, hypothermia is calculated according to the body surface area. So very important to know that. And small children become hypothermic much faster than adults. So it's very important to remember this. Injury patterns may be different in kids and you've got to be aware of that. And the history may be difficult to elicit. So these are some points which I've put in into a nutshell. When you're dealing with pediatric trauma cases, keep these in mind, okay? In the elderly, again, there may be reduced physiological reservoir of, uh, you know, respiratory reservoir, uh, cardiac reservoir, renal reservoir. So it's important to know that these guys will go off faster than a young healthy adult. Multiple comorbidities. So it's important to get a good history from either the attendant or the relative particularly looking at coronary artery disease, because if you've got coronary artery disease and you've got hypotension, there's very much chances that the guy will get an MI because of the reduced circulation of the blood. So coronary artery disease, COPD, uh, renal dysfunction, these are two or three important things that you must know when you're dealing with elderly patients. Long-term medications are very, very important. It's surprising the number of times we forget about it. And uh, the trauma patient is two days in the in the A and E, and we have forgotten to give his regular medication through the NG. So long term medications are important. We need to know what what he's taking because all of them may actually alter the response to stress and make the patient more uh, compromised and will give you worse outcomes. So very important to restart whatever the medications they are on as soon as possible. Trauma in pregnant patients is another ball game altogether. 
uh, because there are both anatomical changes in the body of the patient and physiological changes. It's different if she's eight or nine months pregnant and you can obviously see the pregnancy. The worst is when you have not elicited a history of early pregnancy. That is the worst thing. So very, very, very important that whenever you get a female within the uh, age group of uh, birthing, you must ask for a history of pregnancy or do a pregnancy test. It doesn't matter because you will miss a, a three month, four month pregnancy and you will treat them as if you're treating a normal patient. And very often you will cause harm to the child and you, she might lose the fetus. So it's very important to ask the history of uh, so early identification of pregnancy is mandatory, mandatory when you've got a female patient. And it is care of mother and fetus, not just the mother. It's care of mother and the fetus. Hence, you must very early involve an obstetrician, particularly if it's an advanced pregnancy or term pregnancy. Very, very, very important to involve the obstetrician. Okay. All right. Now let's look at trauma radiology. So we've done a little bit about the ABCDE. We look quickly at the radiology and uh, of course, all radiology starts with chest X-ray uh, and a chest X-ray will give you all of these, okay? Any, all or any of these, pneumothorax, hemothorax, fracture ribs, male, pulmonary cardiac. Now I've not put up the chest X-rays here because I'm going to discuss each one of this separately. So aortic injury is very important. Very early, you must sense aortic injuries and particularly when you've got first rib fractures, when you've got scapula fractures, the, the the, the alarm bell should start ringing because these uh, uh, areas don't fracture that easily. So the moment you've got a first rib fracture or a scapular fracture, always think aortic injury. And I'll talk about aortic injury in more detail later on. But in the chest X-ray, you'll see widened mediastinum. You might see loss of an aortic uh, knob shadow, tracheal or esophageal deviation to the opposite side, widening of the paraspinal strip or apical capping and downward displacement of the left main stem bronchus. This actually is, is a question. Uh, uh, this comes from a question and these are the answers that you have to give. There are two slides on this. You must know this. This is a very, very good question to be asked because each one of them is self-explanatory. Obliteration of aortopulmonary windows, fracture first rib sternum or scapula, multiple rib fractures of flail chest and massive hematoras, okay? So all of this or any of this will actually suggest to you that you've got aortic injury, do not forget to do an angiogram, okay? Very important. All right, what is FAST? Okay, FAST is focused assessment with sonography for trauma. Uh, ultrasound has got a great role in trauma and uh, use of FAST has become a routine in almost all high profile trauma units. And what we are looking for is collection of fluid in any of these areas which suggests that there is bleeding, okay? So it usually looks at the abdomen first. So hepatorenal window, which is the Morrison's pouch, gives you a good idea whether there's liver trauma. A splenic window gives you an idea about bleeding in and around the spleen. A sub window gives you an idea of pericardial collection, very important. And the suprapubic window, which is the Douglas's pouch, which gives you an idea of bleed anywhere in the abdomen which has gone into the pelvis or a primary pelvic bleed. So fast is important. You must know this, you must know the fast. But more important than fast is e-fast, okay? So I'll talk about that. The sensitivity for uh, fast is 56%. The specificity is 80 to 90%, okay? So you may miss some uh, collections, but what you see will definitely tell you there's bleed. So that is the uh, understanding that, that sensitivity and specificity gives you. And EFAST is, is, is fast plus bilateral hemithorax to look for hemothorax and upper anterior chest wall to look for pneumothorax. So hemothorax and pneumothorax is EFAST. So fast plus the chest is called as EFAST. And we ask that quite often uh, in, in when we are discussing trauma, I'll ask them, what is EFAST? And you need to know the EFAST is extended fast. Okay, so extended focused assessment with sonography for trauma. Okay, let's look at angiography. I've not looked at CT as yet because I'm gonna look at CT with each one of the pathologies as we deal with it. Okay, so uh, usually uh, aortic injuries happen because of high speed acceleration, deceleration injury. 
तो उसको उधर घटा लगा फिर हमको जमीन तो मिले So angiography is uh, uh, sorry. Aortic injuries happen because of acceleration, deceleration injury. What happens is your your when you in a moving vehicle, your body and all the organs are moving at a certain acceleration. When the impact happens, your body continues to move ahead, and the fixed points in the body, the one fixed point is the ligamentum arteriosum. So the fixed point in the body suddenly decelerates. so the aorta continues to move ahead the ligamentum uh, arteriosum decelerates and pulls on the aorta and unfortunately that causes a tear in the aorta and so aortic injuries are very common in high speed traumas but they do not show themselves uh, they are sometimes very subtle if it if it's a clear cut uh, transaction the guy will die on the spot so 50% of these guys will never even reach the ane but the ones which have got the subtle trauma that is more important to to understand okay so uh, high speed acceleration deceleration injury you must think of angiography upper extremity hypertension unexplained hypertension pulse deficits or asymmetries presence of a new systolic murmur or presence of asystolic murmur and mediastinal hematoma all of these should raise your suspicion that something is going wrong in the vascular system of the body and we need to start trauma uh, chest radiography findings of aortic injuries which i told you about earlier uh, and all of this the moment you see any of these think of angiography because angiography is the gold standard and ct aortogram is gold standard for diagnosing uh, aortic injuries okay and what you look for is intraluminal thrombi you look for mural dissections you look for any intimal flaps or look for changes to the diameter or contour of the aorta this is absolutely important a high index of suspicion must be maintained when you have chest x ray showing some changes to think of aortic injuries and the two i told you is first rib fracture and scapular fracture okay this is how an er thoracotomy happens uh, we do it emergency in the er and the indication for an er thoracotomy usually it's a it's a anterolateral or an anterior thoracotomy and the indications are very clear cut again this is an exam question this you must know uh, because if you are in trauma you need to know when to open the chest and that's what they are asking you uh, unresponsive hypotension systolic bp less than 60 mm of mercury exsanguination from a chest tube of more than 1.5 liters uh, traumatic arrest but with previous witness cardiac activity so the guy had cardiac activity it was going on and then suddenly he dropped his activity after a penetrating thoracic injury is the time you open the chest and go in there or persistent hypotension where you suspect a cardiac tamponade or air embolism okay so this is actually very very clear cut you must know each one of this by heart and when we ask you you should be able to reproduce this in the exam the relative indications for a thoracotomy are blunt and penetrating traumas uh, it 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 is in blunt and penetrating traumas they could be traumatic arrest with previously witnessed cardiac activity pre hospital cardiopulmonary resuscitation in a patient uh, less than 10 minutes in an intubated patient uh, less than 5 minutes in a non intubated patient so these are relative indications if, if a patient comes to you with any of these situations then you need to jump in and probably open the chest you might be able to save lives contraindication is blunt thoracic injury with no previous witness cardiac attack don't do a thoracotomy on somebody who's already dead okay the dead guy has to be left alone get on to the next patient multiple blunt traumas if there are too many blunt traumas and things uh, there could be more than one cause of the problem the reason why you open the chest is because the chest could be the cause of the bleed that's why or severe head injury okay in patients with severe head head injuries try not to do uh, uh, okay all right okay so now let's get into each one of these is it making sense guys or is it getting too boring yes, no sir, sir. it is perfect so there we go perfect 
Yeah, is it? Is I I don't know if I'm doing too much. Uh, no, I, no, I thought there's only one lecture for trauma. Might as well cover everything for you guys. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, it's going good. And, and, yeah, I'm sorry. It is very detailed. But it is important that at one time you cover everything so that you can go back and refer to it. Okay. Thank you. So let's get back to the management. Switch off your microphones and let's get back to management. Okay. Thoracic trauma. So after all this jig jigma roll, now we come to the real crux of the talk. That is thoracic trauma. So thoracic trauma are two types: blunt and penetrating. Uh, please switch off your microphone. Who is that? Malapan paide limbu cha zoos band kara. <laughs> trauma can be blunt or penetrating. Okay. You got to remember, I'm fasting, guys. Okay, and it's end of the day. <laughs> I'm trying my best to stay with you. Okay, blunt injuries. <laughs> What are the causes of blunt injuries? There can be a direct blow to the chest. There can be acceleration, deceleration injury. We spoke about this. There can be compression injuries of the chest. Okay, so you could be compressed or crushed under a a, a bulky thing, and that could cause a blunt injury to the chest. The other mechanism is high speed deceleration or crush as i told you common things are falls sport mishaps and blasts okay this is where you will get blunt injury to the chest the blast kinetic energy that hits a bystander because the lung has got air within it has got gas within it the kinetic energy rapidly expands the gas and then you get a lung injury internal lung injury so this is for a bystander he may not even be close to the site of the thing but as the wave spreads out it enters the body and it agitates the air within the lung and that agitated lung will cause a minor blast within the lung so you get a lot of pulmonary contusion in some patients and this could be a blunt injury there's nothing gone in but he's got severe pulmonary contusions you can get pulmonary hemorrhage hypoxia and shock in these patients uh, secondary to this uh, there could be associated multi organ injury and this is the most important cause uh, thoracic is the reason why most people die in trauma that is why the thoracic trauma has to be taken care of as soon as possible the first cause of uh, mortality is thoracic second cause is cns okay so very important to understand these sort of injuries uh, the blunt trauma can affect chest wall can affect rib fractures you can have flail chest sternal fractures clavicular fractures or scapular fractures the lung injuries that you see are pulmonary contusion with associated pneumothorax hemothorax tension pneumothorax has to be addressed very quickly again you get asked this question what are the x ray findings of tension pneumothorax please take this down a mediastinal shift to the contralateral side kinking and obstruction of the vena cava reduced venous return sorry this is not the x ray finding this is the mechanism of tension pneumothorax so mediastinal shift to the contralateral side will cause kinking and obstruction of the vena cava this will reduce the venous return and hence indirectly reduce the cardiac output that will cause profuse hypotension and will cause cardiac arrest so this is the mechanism of why tension pneumothorax causes cardiac arrest so media channel shift vena cava kink venous return uh, reduced cardiac output falls hypotension and arrest okay clinical diagnosis it's always a diagnosis of clinical importance you 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 should never ever see a chest x ray or a ct scan with tension pneumothorax very often in the exam we love to put up a chest x ray of tension pneumothorax and we ask you what's wrong with this situation the first answer is that this x ray should not have been done that is the answer okay so you should never ever have to wait for a chest x ray to tell you pneumothorax is there but uh, the findings are deviated trachea to the contralateral side decreased expansion on ipsilateral side decreased breath sounds on ipsilateral side increased percussion note on the same side and distended neck veins and raised dvp again this is actually part of an mct so take this very seriously this is every single point i have put comes in in an mct so be very careful about this one okay the next is uh, i told you about clinical diagnosis you should never have a chest x ray emergency decompression is the treatment and a large bore cannula in the second intercostal space or a icd is the treatment for tension pneumothorax the first is of course a large bore cannula in the second intercostal space and then put in an icd very 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 important 
Rarely you might have to do emergency thoracotomy, but only a chest tube is enough sometimes. Uh, and the chest just say afterwards to make sure that your chest tube is okay. All right. So that's about tension pneumothorax. Now I'm going to cover each one of these little by little to give you insights on what to say in the exam. Uh, hemothorax, very important. Hemothorax management is asked uh, in the thing. Uh, usually the problems with hemothorax are hypovolemia. Uh, look for absent breath sounds. Look for dumbness to percussion. And the chest x-ray may occasionally be confused with collapse. If it's getting too long, I'm quite happy to stop and uh, you know you guys can uh, do it on another day. I don't mind. Hello? Uh, no, sir, it's fine. No, sir, it's okay. Yeah, because I, I get a feeling that people are getting a little... Nothing like it. Nothing like it. All right. Request all no, no, sir, switch off okay. their mic. Yeah, exactly. yeah, Just switch off your mics, guys, because it, it makes me feel as if suddenly it's getting very boring and it's become too prolonged. I, I don't mind stopping at any point. All of this is there, but uh, you can stop me at any point. Okay. All right. Okay. So hemothorax is important. You need to know clinically how to diagnose hemothorax. Uh, rapid decompression and fluids are needed in a hemothorax. Intercostal chest drain forms a part of management of hemothorax. But many a times when you've got just suddenly 1.5 liters or one and a half liter come out, you clamp the drain. So, so clamping the ICD is also a strategy that is used in a hemothorax because you're hoping that by not allowing the blood to come out, you're causing a tamponade. But real treatment in that situation is a thoracotomy. You need to open the chest, okay? So you need to think surgical intervention when you've got massive amount of hemothorax coming about. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So what are the patients in whom you undergo early thoracotomy? Again, a very, very, very classic exam question will be asked. So hemodynamic instability, persistent requirement of blood transfusion, very important. Blood loss of more than 200 ml per hour for two to four hours, usually three hours is the figure, but some papers have said two, some papers have said four. So two to four hours is what you've got to say. Penetrating injury between the mid clavicular line. This is important, okay? Anything that's medial to the nipple, on the two sides is, is a sign for early thoracotomy. And don't forget penetrating injury medial to scapula at the back. And that is why it's very important to actually see the back of the patient because this is according to the guidelines. These are indications for early thoracotomy. So penetrating injury medial to the scapula is also recommended. Okay, all right. Is this clear? So far so good, hemothorax is okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, now, sir. open sucking yes, wounds. Okay. So what happens in an open sucking wound? Just one second. Somebody is... Okay. Let's look at open sucking wound. The problem with an open sucking wound is, is twofold because the airway has what is called as a high resistance low flow. It's a tube, isn't it? So a tube has certain resistance in it. The resistance is high and because there's negative interpleural pressure and your accessory muscles of respiration and the diaphragm moving, air can flow into this tube and you can get ventilated. The moment you make a hole on the side of the chest, then it becomes a low resistance high flow. Any area where there is low resistance, air will preferentially rush in. Here there is high resistance. So your oxygenation will be directly affected by a contralateral low resistance hole. And that is the problem with open sucking wounds, okay? It should be wounds, not wound, okay? So this is also called as open pneumothorax, okay? So you've got to do the ABCs, you've got to save the patient, but you've got to close the wound and you've got to do chest drain. And closure of the wound is done in this way, I'll show you. So what you have to do is you have to start high flow oxygen because the high resistance that is there in the airway, you've got to overcome the high resistance and push in oxygen from the airway. And then you've got to put a sterile occlusive dressing, three-way sterile occlusive dressing, but that is taped on three sides and one side is open. So the open side will allow the trapped air to come out. So you must have, it's like a one-way valve. You're creating a one-way valve to allow the pneumothorax to come out 
and you are pushing air into the high resistance tube. So the airway is the high resistance tube and you've closed the low resistance hole on the side and uh, you've left one thing open to allow that the air to rush out. So that's quite important. And then of course, progressive airway management. If the patient needs to be ventilated, so be it. You need to intubate and ventilate the patient. Okay. So that's the management of uh, open uh, sucking wounds. What about pulmonary contusions? We all see that. Uh, they, they are secondary to parenchymal injuries, could be due to tracheobronchial injuries, and you might also have pneumomediastinum in some conditions, okay? So most of these patients who've got pulmonary contusions will either present with dyspnea, tachypnea, hemoptysis, cyanosis, or hypotension, any or all of these, okay? So this is very important. Clinically, when you assess a patient, you should be able to think of pulmonary contusion. CT scan is very sensitive, very good tool for picking up pulmonary contusions. So you should do a CT scan. Uh, if a patient has injury severity score of more than 65, along with pulmonary contusions, there is very high risk of him going into ARDS. Okay, and you need to know, if you're going to read trauma, you need to know ISS, okay? I'm not, I didn't cover it because this was, uh, uh, more of thoracic trauma, but ISS is a whole chart which uh, helps you uh, classify the severity of the injury, okay? So this is a very important paper, actually, which talks about risk of ARDS with pulmonary contusion. And the answer to that is anybody with an injury, uh, ISS score of more than 65 has a high chance of getting ARDS. And so you must very quickly intubate the patient. And intubation is sometimes therapeutic for these patients. Usually you don't need to operate on pulmonary contusions. Most of the times, just good conservative management, looking after the ABCD is enough to actually get the patient through, okay? Occasionally you might get associated pneumomediastinum. If it's an anterior pneumomediastinum, you, you got to think of uh, injuries to the lung in the anterior, or you got to think of, uh, of uh, upper airway injuries, okay? If it's a posterior pneumomediastinum, then you got to think of esophageal injuries. So it's quite, they're two different types. So it's important to remember which side. Sometimes you might get pneumomediastinum and putting in a chest tube may actually help you because you might uh, take away the pneumothorax, which is happening. But very often, if the lung is stuck to the chest wall, it might be very difficult to put in a chest tube. And very often when you get pneumomediastinum, you might not know which side is causing the pneumomediastinum. And in that scenario, you might have to put a chest tube on both sides, okay? Hold on. Let's look at rib fractures, all right? So rib fractures can be single or multiple. We had a brilliant lecture on rib fractures by Harish. Uh, there can be flail segments. The rib fracture can be anterior or posterior. They can be hairline or they can be displaced. So undisplaced or displaced. Uh, usually four to nine ribs if they are injured. Think of lung, bronchus, pleura, heart. Okay, very important. Four to nine rib fractures are always associated with these four organs. There could be some injury to any one of these four organs. If it's nine to 12, think about spleen, liver, renal, kidneys, okay? Very important, spleen, liver, kidneys. So the, the site of the fracture will give you a clue of what further injuries could be there in the patient. And most, uh, they usually present with pain, tenderness, and carpetus, okay? Uh, 3D reconstructions can be done, which will show you the thing. So CT scan is very good. First rib is very important. You must, must, must look for first rib fracture uh, because you really need severe force to fracture the first rib. And there's a frequent correlation with aortic transaction. So very important whenever first rib fracture is present. Remember the force of the injury was very severe. And so think of more intrathoracic injuries. Very, very important. And always insist on an aortogram quite important. Uh, binders are not recommended these days. Now, all the, all the, uh, I've looked at everything that's out there and almost everybody has almost given up on using chest binding as a treatment for rib fractures. In fact, they say it is detrimental because it causes more atelectasis. You are not able to uh, do proper respiration. So binders are actually contraindicated now in rib fractures not to be used. The first philosophy is relief of pain, most important. You must do maximum relief of pain. And as Hari showed us, he's got various packages of pain relief and you can have whatever is your strategy, but pain relief is very, very important to prevent atelectasis, okay? And optimization of pulmonary toilet. So physiotherapy, 
uh, yoga, whatever you've got, you must use every single technique to optimize the uh, expectoration from the lung and prevent atelectasis. Because most of these people have secondary complications of lung infection. So the last thing you want is a chest infection. So you try your best to uh, change that. Uh, four indicators for rib fracture fixation. We discussed them yesterday in great detail. I want this to become your mantra. Do not go fixing every rib. The first indication is inability to get the patient off ventilator. Okay, that's the most important indication for fixing a rib. Flail segment with progressive need for ventilatory care. Chronic unresolved pain, which is progressing and not getting controlled by whatever techniques you're using and many or multiple distracted fractures, which are progressively getting worse with time are an indication for fixing the ribs, okay? There are, this is all the papers that have looked at it and we spoke about it uh, yesterday or day before. Uh, all rib fracture fixations lead to reduced incidence of pneumonia, reduced incidence of ventilatory need. They all shorten ICU stay. They improve vital capacity at six months and they have all shown to have earlier return to work. So whenever I ask you in the exam, why do you want to fix a rib? These are the answers I expect from you, okay? You should be able to give me one, two, three, four, five. This is the answers that should come up, okay? This is the guideline which has come. This is uh, Costas's paper. Costas Papagianopoulos is from uh, Leeds. And uh, this is for fixation of ribs. He's got a very nice thing uh, where he talks about all the things that I told you are present in this guideline, okay? So whenever you've got chest wall deformity or when you've got severely dislocated ribs, surgical stabilization is indicated. So the four points which I told you are very much in this uh, pathway. So you, you must know this pathway. It's a very nice way of managing multiple rib fractures. Uh, surgery, we've all seen this. Uh, you can use whatever you like. You can use plates if you want. Uh, see these plates are fixed at the end with screws. Some of them are fixed with wires. So you can do whatever you like, it, it's all right. Uh, there are various devices available out there. There is the Stratos system. Uh, this is how the Stratos system works. There is a rib lock system, which actually is, uh, it shows that if you use a plate and you go too low, your screw can hit the intercostal neurovascular bundle. So the rib lock uh, attaches to the top of the rib. It's a system which attaches to just hooks on the top of the rib, and then you put in your screw through there. So there is no chance of you injuring the neurovascular bundle. This is uh, talked about. A NITI system is made of nitinol and these are actually, they have a predetermined memory. So they shape themselves to the uh, shape of the rib. So they, they can actually, come, they come with predetermined memory and when you put it in, the moment it gets heat, heated up with the tissue and it reaches a certain temperature, it changes its shape and contours along with the contour of the of the rib, so that's another good system. Uh, KLS Martin is another system of multiple screws and plates. Uh, and these, the, the advantage of these is these contour very well to the things. The plates are one long plate and they get to come into a predetermined shape. Whereas these actually will change the shape with the respiration. So when the bucket handle movement kicks in, these uh, KLS Martin system actually allows the bucket handle movement of the rib and does not uh, lose its contour. So these are the few benefits. Uh, flail chest, we discussed in great detail uh, in that uh, lecture, and I'll just talk a few things. Uh, three or more ribs at two sides is the standard definition of flail chest. You could be unilateral or bilateral. Uh, it usually impairs respiratory mechanics uh, because you get paradoxical movement into the chest, as I showed you in the previous uh, picture. It can cause hyperventilation and atelectasis. Uh, endotracheal intubation is usually indicated uh, when the patient is uh, compromised. But most important thing with play, play, flail chest is pain relief, okay? Very important. And epidural is very much part of a pain, pain relief protocol in many, many hospitals. So a lot of hospitals actually put in an epidural as a primary treatment for pain relief in, in fracture ribs. But uh, Harish said in his hospital, they're not using it. And, and that's fine. Everybody has got different uh, strategies. And of course, chest wall stabilization is mandatory in these groups. Uh, again, there is a, a guideline for management of uh, flail chest. Uh, not all flail chests are operated upon. Uh, only when they become ventilator dependent uh, is when you go down or they become dislocated rib fracture is when you do surgical stabilization. 
So this pathway is important. A simple flail fracture follows a simple rib pathway. And two, two ribs with two fractures is not indicated for st surgical stabilization. So these two guidelines, which I showed you, you must follow it and you must quote this paper. It's published in JTD. Okay, and Costas has got a lot of experience with chest wall surgery. And so these are good guidelines. I like them. And they, both the guidelines actually come down to the four uh, indications that I told you uh, at the start of the uh, rib fracture section. Okay, so airway, breathing, circulation, we spoke about it. Uh, think about analgesia early, whatever is your preferred method and prophylactic ventilation may be used. Uh, uh, physiotherapy is very important. Very, very, very important in flail chest. Antibiotics are important. You might have to do bronchoscopy and suction out because very often these guys get thick mucus secretions. So there's something like this. Uh, it doesn't happen on the first day. It happens on the third, fourth, fifth day uh, when you are managing them and suddenly you get a whiteout in the whole left side. Uh, so you got to think about it. Is this uh, mucus impaction or is it bleeding? Is it a hemothorax? So these are questions that you have to answer. Uh, very clearly, if you look carefully at this chest X-ray, you can see air going into the left main bronchus and there's a sharp cut off here. So when you think of that, I personally do bronchoscopy first, no matter what. And so once you do a bronchoscopy, you'll be able to get out something like this, and then suddenly you'll have the whole lung re-expanded. And so it will save you putting in a chest tube. Okay, sternal fractures. Usually seen in motor vehicle injuries, usually uh, scheduled, usually treated by conservative management. Very rarely do you need to actually operate on uh, st sternal fractures. Less than 2% of people, you operate on sternal fractures. And most of the times, the indication for surgery is a severely displaced sternal fracture, uh, which you're worried will cause uh, hemodynamic instability or will aggravate cardiac uh, trauma. Uh, all sternal fractures should be admitted to hospital. You cannot send a sternal fracture from the a &E home. You should not because there is evidence to show that if a person has got sternal fracture, there could be associated cardiac injury. And the cardiac injury may not be evident at the time of the presentation, but may become evident 24 hours later. Hence, it is mandatory that all sternal fractures should be admitted. It is one of the criteria for admission via the a &E. At least 24 hours, you must do an echocardiogram at the time of the fracture, but the, uh, at the time of the admission, but the echocardiogram has to be repeated 24 hours later because pericardial effusion can start to occur and present 24 hours later. And you send the patient home and he will have slow tamponade and suddenly come in a very critical state, okay? So very important to repeat an echocardiography before you discharge the patient. So no sternal fracture should be discharged without a repeat echocardiography. And of course, you have to look at cardiac enzymes. They are quite important. They give you a clue if there is any associated myocardial injury. Sternal uh, fractures can be fixed with plates, screws, uh, KY, uh, K, your normal steel wires, anything. You can use whatever. There are lots of things available. Okay. And so this is the sort of fixation plates that are available. Uh, many, many different types are available. You can, you can uh, there are so many types, you'll be surprised uh, for sternal fractures. So I just put in one or two just to show you what, what is needed. But what is needed is just stabilize the fracture, okay? Clavicular fractures are frequently present in chest traumas. Uh, don't forget conservative management is the main treatment for clavicular fractures. You rarely operate on clavicular fractures. Most of the time, pain control, figure of eight sling, but only when you're worried about vascular injury. Okay, is the time that you fix the clavicular fracture. So subclavian artery and subclavian vein are right behind there. So you've got to be very, very careful. And most of the fixations are with plates and screws. Uh, the problem long-term they can have is malunion, shoulder mechanics can be a problem, or thoracic, they can develop thoracic outlet syndromes because uh, the callus that forms uh, in the subclavian triangle, in the subclavian area may cause compression on the subclavian artery and subclavian vein. I showed you that uh, when I did the talk on thoracic outlet syndromes and, and the clavicular fractures are known cause of thoracic outlet syndromes. And, and of course, because there's injury to the subclavian artery or the vein, you can get pseudoaneurysms uh, and of course associated brachial plexus injuries. So this is something that you got to remember when you're talking about clavicular fractures. Okay. But most of the times, 99%, it is conservative management. Okay. 
Scapular fractures are rare, but you must look at a chest X-ray very carefully to pick up scapular fractures because the scapula doesn't fracture easily. And if a scapula fractures, rest assured, it's a high impact energy thing. And you need a three view trauma series. It's called as a three view trauma series, which looks at the chest from AP, lateral and oblique. And all three views will actually give you uh, subtle scapular fractures. The moment you see a scapular fracture, order an angiogram. It is mandatory and CT angiogram or a CT iotogram is mandatory, okay? Most of scapular fractures are treated conservatively. You never really need to operate on a scapular fracture, but they are indications of deeper problems. Uh, so always uh, remember that. Uh, in addition to that, you can get uh, blunt trauma to any of these structures. We've done the chest wall and thing. Uh, laryngeal injuries, tracheobronchial injuries, great vessels, blunt cardiac, diaphragm, and esophagus. These are the things that can be injured in blunt trauma. I'll quickly go through each one of this. Uh, laryngeal injury is, is rare, but the mortality is very high. Uh, usually the death is because of laryngospasm. Usually found in road traffic accident, hanging, sports, karate, soccer, fall. Okay, these are the mechanisms of injury. Uh, usual symptoms are hoarseness, pain, confusion, crepitus, dysphagia, or airway obstruction. Everything is self-explanatory. Uh, CT scan is usually diagnostic. Laryngeal injuries can very well be picked up by a CT scan, but remember it has to be a trauma CT. Trauma CT is head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis. It's not just chest and abdomen. Trauma CT is different from normal CT. So you must do a trauma CT. The protocol has to be trauma CT. Whenever you write in the form, you have to write a CT scan trauma protocol. So when you drive trauma protocol, automatically top to bottom gets scanned in a CT scan, okay? The treatment is usually intubation and you might have to do tracheostomy and then you might have to do primary repair of the larynx. And there is some very good papers on laryngeal injuries which talk about how the primary repair should be done. But because we are thoracic surgeons, I've tried not to jump too much into this, but I'll show you some uh, repairs in a, in a bit. So tracheobronchial injuries are usually present within two centimeters of the carina. Uh, most of them are present, 46% uh, are present on the right side as opposed to the left side because the left side is well protected by the arch of aorta and things like that. Uh, usually presents with subcutaneous emphysema, pneumothorax, hemoptysis. Whenever you have an undiagnosed air leak and whenever you have an air leak which is ferocious and whenever you have an air leak which is intermittently ferocious, three words are used. When it's an undiagnosed air leak, when it is a ferocious air leak, and when it is an intermittently ferocious air leak. That means sometimes it is ferocious, sometimes it is okay. Suspect tracheobronchial injury because you might have a flap. And sometimes the flap may occasionally give you massive air leak and then the pneumothorax happens, the lung goes down, the flap closes. So an intermittent ferocious air leak is a very good clinical sign to think of tracheobronchial injuries, okay? Particularly bronchial injuries. So it's very important to understand this. Uh, the, the real treatment for this is flexible bronchoscopy, but the important thing is the bronchoscopy must be done with withdrawal of the ETT. So you go through the ETT and go from distal to proximal and as you come proximal, you must withdraw the ETT all the way up to the vocal cord so that you see the entire length of the tracheobronchial tree. You'll be surprised the number of times that upper airway things are missed because the bronchoscopy went through the ETT and went distally. So the answer for this is you must do flexible bronchoscopy with withdrawal of the ETT. It's suggests to me that you understand that there is a concept of upper airway injury because stairs may be missed very, very often. Okay, so quite important. Uh, treatments are, one is you can just put the ETT, ET tube. It's a small uh, membranous stair. It will heal on its own. Uh, so ET tube is therapeutic, allowing the airway to heal. Uh, you might have to do primary surgical repair depending upon whatever is the site of the, of the tube. Uh, sometimes that uh, resection, uh, sometimes the uh, tear may be so bad or it's comminuted or it's, uh, it's, it's very badly shaped or you've missed the tear for a long period of time. 
And if that's happened, then the lung gets compromised and you might have to do a lobectomy or a pneumonectomy. But most of the times, <clears throat> whenever we deal with tracheobronchial injuries, we always try to conserve lung. You try to do a primary surgical repair and conserve lung. That should be the philosophy of management of tracheobronchial injuries. Occasionally, you can use endobronchial stenting as well. A covered stent can be used as a therapy for allowing the uh, tear to heal over the covered stent. Okay, and the late complications of any of these is bronchial stenosis, recurrent pneumonias, and bronchiectasis. Okay, is that clear? Is everybody clear? So far, so good? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes. Are you still with me or you yes. want me to stop? With you, sir. Good. Let's finish this topic. Please go on, sir. Okay, once and for all. Let's finish it. Okay. All right. What about great vessels? This is very important. So descending thoracic aorta, if it ruptures 50% fatality, they die on the spot. There is no chance, okay? And I told you ligamentum arterialism is the point where there is lapid deceleration at a fixed point. So it's very, very difficult. Uh, it's a very classical where that uh, thing happens. Now, this is important. You've got to know this. Kirch and Sloan sign gets asked very often, also called in the fallen lung sign. So you, Kirch and Sloan is for... Uh, uh, for the uh, trauma of aorta, uh, widened mediastinal, loss of aortic contour, mediastinal shift to right side, elevation of lung island, depression of the right lung. So elevation of the left, depression of the right, first you fracture shift of NG to the left, left-sided hemothorax, and a retrocardiac density. This is all part of the Kirsch and Sloan sign. Okay? And each one we have discussed before, but I'm repeating it because this uh, unfortunately gets asked in the exam. So you must know these, all of these. Okay, so widened mediastinum, loss of an aortic console, mediastinal shift to the right, elevation of the left lung hilum because of the hematoma, depression of the right hilum, first rib fracture, shift of a nasogastric tube to the left because of widening mediastinum, a left-sided hemothorax, or a retrocardiac density. All of these suggest aortic injury. CT scan with angiography is the gold standard for these things, okay? 96% specificity and 99% sensitivity. So it is the gold standard. You must say CT iotograms, very important. Management is careful invasive blood pressure monitoring. You need to actually reduce the blood pressure. Uh, heart rate control, you might use IV beta blockers or nitroprusides. And nowadays, very rarely, if uh, you have to actually operate on these guys. If this guy has managed to be alive, and come to the uh, to the ER, and if he's still stable, then an endovascular stent is good enough to cover that uh, thing. And and you really need a good uh, interventional guy because you have a risk that there is not much landing zone. You usually need a two centimeter landing zone for an endovascular stent to be placed. The problem is the point where the tear happens is exactly the point where the left subclavian takes off. And uh, there is a high chance that you might actually compromise the left subclavian. So now they have special stents available, uh, which are which have got a side hole uh, for the left subclavian. You've got stents which have got a side hole for left subclavian, left common carotid. Okay, so you can increase your landing zone, uh, but but you really need to be an expert interventional radiologist or a cardiologist to place these stents. Uh, because there's a high risk of uh, losing circulation to the left hand, uh, and more importantly, losing circulation to the to the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery comes uh, in that area, and uh, you can get spinal ischemia uh, with endovascular stents. So it is very important you discuss these with the patients before you take them in for surgery. And of course, the last but not the least is surgical repair, uh, actual going in there and doing what you need to do. So as I said, it is this is all there. Uh, a TOE, I forgot to mention. TOE is a very good tool actually uh, to assess the descending aorta. So it is important to also, if it's if he's intubated and ventilated, don't forget to use TOE. It will give you a good idea of what's happening around the aorta. And more importantly, in the follow-up, don't forget delayed pseudoaneurysm. Quite important to understand. Okay. What about blunt cardiac? Usually these are the forms, RTA, falls, crush, blast, frontal assault, chest pain. ECG will show new onset sinus tachycardia. 
and there may be associated uh, sternal fractures and new onset sinus tachycardia suggests that there's a cardiac myocardial injury. Uh, ST elevation will be present, okay? And you got to look for CKMB, troponin I and troponin T, most important. And not just a single shot, but you've got to look at progression. So 24 hours later, you've got to repeat the troponin I and troponin T. CKMB may be elevated even because of the muscle crush and muscle injury, but troponin I and troponin T are quite specific for the myocardium. And uh, echocardiography is mandatory, either TE or TOE, depending upon uh, what is available. This is the frequency. This is important to remember that the frequency of injury to the heart is RV more than RA, more than LV, more than LA. The reason is the LA is the furthest at the back. So it's less likely to be injured, okay? So RV more than RA, more than LV, more than LA. This is the order of frequency. So whenever you get cardiac injuries, first look at the RV, make sure the RV is not injured, then RA. So that's the way it goes. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, uh, echocardiography will show you wall motion abnormalities. Uh, uh, it might show you some ischemic changes. You will also see effusion, pericardial effusion. You might see valvular defects, which were sudden and new, which weren't there before. You might see septal defects, uh, VSDs, uh, which might develop because of cardiac injury, or you might see a chamber rupture. If you see a chamber rupture, that's the end of the story. But really, there's a lot of findings on echocardiography which will suggest to you that you're dealing with a blunt cardiac injury, okay? Usually admission, anybody with sternal fractures or suspected cardiac admission mandatory, do not send them home. Make sure that you do ECG monitoring, but the young ones are okay. Is the old ones where you need to be careful about associated coronary artery disease, and some of them may even need surgical intervention. And surgery is depending on what is uh, injured, okay? A uh, cardiac tamponade is, is, is another frequent thing that you might see in trauma scenarios, uh, usually uh, secondary to penetrating injuries. Clinical is this shock, raised JVP, uh, PEA, and pulses paradoxes. Okay, this is the classical triad of, uh, uh, of cardiac tamponade, the Bex triad as it's called as. So distended neck veins, muffled heart sounds, and a hypertension. Very classical, should know this, will be asked in the exam. Rest assured, okay? All right. It's always a clinical decision, cardiac tamponade. <clears throat> Echocardiography is used to augment the clinical decision. <clears throat> Just like uh, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade is always a clinical decision. You must very quickly make the decision that this guy is tamponading. Even if echocardiography doesn't show it, you got to suspect cardiac tamponade. And volume resuscitation, pericardiocentesis may be required and occasionally surgical explosion, exploration may be needed to get uh, on top of the tamponade. In a blunt, it might just be a slow tamponade, but in a penetrating, it can be an acute tamponade, and that definitely needs surgical exploration. <clears throat> and this is the surgical exploration. You just open, do an anterior thoracotomy, and uh, open up the pericardium and lead out the blood and repair whatever is needed to be repaired that is actually leaking. Uh, diaphragm, not, uh, you know, diaphragm is quite important. Uh, the key thing with diaphragm is usually lateral impacts usually are more likely to rupture it than frontal impacts. That is all, all the mechanics of, uh, of injuries. If you look at trauma and all the papers on mechanics of injuries, it is the lateral impact which causes more extension and distension of the diaphragm and it's more likely to rupture in a lateral impact. Remember this, 95% of the diaphragmatic tear will be on the left. Paradoxical movement of the left abdomen can be seen. Intercostal retraction will be present. Decreased breath sounds and shifting of cardiac sounds. These are the three signs which should give you an idea that something is going wrong here. The abdominal contents have now come into the chest, okay? And uh, chest X-ray, CT scan, ultrasound are very good for diagnosis, very good. And in a trauma scenario, laparoscopy is recommended if there is associated abdominal uh, bleed, then laparoscopy is recommended to repair the diaphragm. If everything is in the chest or if the patient has had previous abdominal surgeries, then you go in by VATS or thoracotomy, whatever is your preferred method. But uh, the recommendation is laparoscopy from below 
rather than from above. So from below, you can pull down and you can you can primarily correct the patient. So primary repair is the is the is the recommended method. Most people should do primary repair. If it, there is much loss and you cannot approximate the two, then you place in a mesh. The mesh should be placed below the diaphragm so that there is the push effect. So when the abdominal cavity goes and hits the mesh, the mesh hits against the diaphragm and it should always be oversized. The mesh should be larger, much larger than the defect so that the push effect will not allow herniation of abdominal contents into the chest, okay? So this is a typical uh, thing that you'll see, where you'll see either the stomach uh, fundus going up or you will see abdominal contents in the left side. And this is uh, an abdominal approach where, uh, where they have seen the diaphragm and they have repaired it, okay? Esophagus, rarely injured, but frequently missed. So rarely injured, but frequently missed. And it's usually a borehole type rupture because suddenly when the impact happens, your epiglottis closes and your abdominal content moves up, the diaphragm moves up and there is increased intra-abdominal pressure because of the seat belt that is coming across your chest. So compression from all sides and the diaphragm rupture. So it's always a rupture rather than a tear. It's a rupture. It ruptures because of the pressure changes and usually missed clinically, hence the mortality with esophageal rupture is very high. Uh, contrast swallow, CT scan, OGD is what's needed, and elective surgical repair if diagnosed. Most important, it should be diagnosed early, and the best outcomes for esophagus is when you repair it surgically. The moment it gets infected, you're in deep shit, it doesn't work very well, and the outcomes gradually drop away quite badly. So if it is uh, infected and it has spilled for a long period of time, or you've had a delayed diagnosis, then antibiotics, pleural drainage, stenting, and TPM. This is the management, okay? Is it making sense so far? Yes. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah. You still want me to continue? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we've done... Yeah, sorry, you were saying? Okay. Okay, continue. All right. So let's finish. The, this is the last part of it. Uh, in fact, there are two parts. So one more part of today. So penetrating injury. This is quite straightforward because you've understood what happens on the blunt side. So most of the management is more or less the same on the penetrating side. But uh, it's important to understand a few philosophies. So stab wounds are different from gunshot wounds. It's very important. So stab wounds, the location is very important. And the mechanism of injury. So what was used to stab? Was it a long knife? Was it a thin knife? Always beware of a thin knife because a thin knife has a small cut on the skin, but it will go in deep and damage something inside and you may not even suspect it. So always worry about the type of knife that was used. It's very important to get that history. Puncture wounds, which are small, may be missed, very easily missed. And unfortunately, by the time you realize it, the patient will bleed to death or you will have very severe outcomes. So very important to do complete undressing of the patient. You have to look everywhere. Exposure is the key for stab wounds, okay? Very, very important. And the one area which is frequently missed is the axilla. So all trauma textbooks say, you must look at the axilla carefully when you have got stab wounds because a tiny wound might be present in the within the axilla and you might miss it and you will end up with a dead patient. So it might be limited. It's usually limited to the track of the knife. So whatever injury happens depends on the length of the knife and whatever is there within the track of the knife can get injured. So you might get surgical emphysema like this because the stab went straight in into the lung and you treat it with a chest strain and that's good enough. But opposing to that is the gunshot wound. Gunshot wounds is a different ball game altogether because gunshot in gunshot wounds, kinetic energy is produced not just by the, by the mass of the bullet, but also by the velocity of the bullet. So the mass of the bullet will create one set of energy and the velocity that it creates, that it generates uh, going across the air will create a second set of energy. And both of these energies have a compounded effect on the uh, injury that you have within the chest. So it is very important to ask what was the type of gun 
very important because different guns have different energies. If it's a Weston uh, Smith and Wesson, it has got very high velocity. Okay, very high. So even though the mass is low, the velocity may be very high. As opposed to that, a local made gun, a katta, will have a low velocity. So it's a different ball game altogether. Okay, and again, a low, a, 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 a very well made bullet may actually pass through the body and cause damage along the track, but a local gun may actually go into the chest and disintegrate and cause a shrapnel effect and cause more local damage uh, and may not pass through the body. So it's very, very, very important in gunshots to identify what is the type of the gun that's been used. And remember, there is a direct injury because of that track and an indirect injury because of dissipation of the kinetic energy to the two sides of the track. Always, always, always look for exit sites. It's very important to understand if the bullet is still in there or not there because bullets can uh, migrate. So very important to know if the bullet is in there or not. So handguns usually have a low energy transfer, but rifles have a high velocity transfer. So again, important whether it is a handgun or a rifle, different ball game altogether. So the history is the key in gunshot injuries, okay? And these are the sort of injuries that we see, uh, that we've seen in Gurga over a period of time. Uh, you know, everything going everywhere. Sometimes bullets embolize, as I told you, they migrate. And uh, usually if there's a bullet in a chest wall and no other injury, I wouldn't take it out. Uh, the problem is when the bullet goes into the chest and goes into the intrathoracic and there is a phenomenon called as bullet migraine embolism. Okay, it's rare, but it does happen. And it can go from A to B and sometimes might go into the vascular structure and might end up in the heart. So migration of bullets to the heart have been recorded. Uh, that is why you have to think about removing bullets, not in the chest wall, but within the plural area, you must think about it. And usually it will come to the right side and suddenly cause occlusion, uh, not because of the bullet, but because of the embolization. And usually the treatment of this is surgery. You have to acutely go in there and take out the bullet, okay? All right, so these are the sort of things that you see. Something, something like this is lying in the chest wall. I'm not worried about this guy, okay? Because this bullet can stay there Unless the patient wants it out, I will not rush in to take it out. But, uh, you know, sometimes, very often the patient wants it out. But sometimes you get these gangsters who've got eight, nine bullets in their body and they don't care. They just carry on with life. And these are marks of war for them. This is another scenario where you get, when you use a, this is a close up injury. The gun has been shot very close to the chest of the person. And because it has been very close, you should always look for what is called as a splatter effect. So you will get the splatter effect around because of the gunpowder and the burn that comes out from the gun. So there's a bit of fire and uh, there's a bit of heat that is generated and there is a splatter effect. So this is important to see when you're looking for this thing and the bullet entry is here. Okay, so this is a different thing, but in because this is a it's medial to the nipple, it's very important to explore this wound because you need to know whether the subclavian artery, subclavian vein have been injured or not. And in fact, in this particular case, we did it by VATS where we went in with, with here I am, made a small incision on the site of the, of the uh, bullet and put in my mediastinoscope actually. And through the mediastinoscope, I followed the bullet in and my anesthetist from the top is using an ultrasound uh, probe to actually see the subclavian artery and vein. And together we are trying to identify where is the bullet because my worry was that if the bullet is impacted into the subclavian artery and I grasp it and pull it out, I will cause a sudden bleed and lose control. So you've got to be very, very careful when you're doing situations like these. In this particular situation, I also had a vascular surgeon in theater with me in case something went wrong. And so we managed to take this out and this has been published. So this is the sort of things you see. Now penetrating trauma can affect chest wall, you can have pulmonary contusions. You can have all of these that we spoke about before. Any of these structures can be damaged. Uh, this is the sort of trauma that you will see. The one thing that you have to do in this patient or not do in this patient is to pull out that knife. If you pull out that knife, the patient is going to die. So you must never, ever, ever pull out a foreign body that has penetrated into the chest until and unless you've got control of the situation. 
So in this scenario, you would do A, B, C, D, E, quickly resuscitate the patient, take him to theater, and I'll talk about it in a minute. This is an impaled injury. So the car uh, rolled over and landed on a stake. Uh, you know, the, these farms have fences and it landed on a fence and one stick went right through the chest to the other side. So impaled injuries management is a different kettle of fish. I'll talk about it. You have to do the A, B, C, D, E. Do not remove the foreign body. Most important, do not remove the, the impaling object, okay? Sometimes you might have to cut the impaling object short outside the body to accommodate the patient on the table. So that last patient which you saw with a whole wooden bar coming across, you have to cut it short close to the chest so that you can actually put the patient on the table, on the operating table. So you, you're allowed to cut it outside, but do not pull that uh, foreign body out. You will, the patient will die immediately because of uncontrolled hemorrhage. I usually will keep a cardiopulmonary standby in theater when I've got something major like this, where I'm expecting a big vessel to be injured. I will always prepare the groin as well when I get into there. And I will open the chest, depends on where the impalement is. I might do a stenotomy, I might do a wide thoracotomy, I might do a clamshell. Completely depends on where this structure has gone through. But my aim in operating theater is to come proximal to the vessel, get control, put a sloop around it, put a snugger, go distal to the potential injury, get control, put a snugger, and that is when I will start taking the impaled object out. It's very, very, very important. Do not move the object till you've got proximal and distal control. And then depending upon whatever happens, you can do whatever is needed for that particular situation. Okay? All right. Chest walls may not uh, need uh, surgical intervention. Small stab may be deep. So remember, think about intercostal artery bleeding. Uh, we can do a VADS ligation for that. Uh, with blast injuries uh, or with degloving injuries, uh, I think uh, Hari showed us an excellent case. Always get infection control first and then do a subsequent chest wall reconstruction, okay? So it's a different philosophy when it comes to chest wall. But this is, the second point is most important. A small stab wound may be deep and do not ignore it. Don't just put a dressing on it and put a, a suture on it and close it. You have to explore it depending upon what was the weapon. So it's quite important, okay? Tracheobronchial injuries are rare, uh, but ATLS guidelines are important. Intubation, tracheostomy, chest X-ray, CT scan, Always start off with the chest uh, drain and uh, the chest will show you either hemothorax, pneumothorax, surgical emphysema, pneumomediastinum, atelectasis, and the one I told you, the fallen sign of Klumke. Look out for these signs, okay? These signs will tell you that you're dealing. This is the fallen sign of Klumke. Can you see that? It's fallen down there and you, you think that this is a pneumothorax. You might put in a chest drain, but uh, really the problem is the lung is completely transected and fallen down. And very often these guys come many days later with a fallen sign with no treatment having been done for these people. So that's a chest tube being put in, but they forgot, they've missed this completely. They've missed the fallen sign of clump case. So it, chest tube is not the answer for it, okay? So you need to get them into theater. You need to do flexible bronchoscopy, very important. Uh, bronchial toilet, you need to suction out everything. Uh, small proximal may be treated with just intubation or with stenting, as I told you earlier. If there is a bronchial injury, always explore. It is quite important that you do explore bronchial injuries. Uh, and primary repair and resection is the, is the philosophy, not lung resection. You should try and avoid lung resection as much as possible. Even in a fallen sign of clumpe, lung, lungs are very forgiving and you'll be surprised how often you might be able to actually join it back together and get the lung back. There are many, many case reports which have been published for fallen lung, which were reattached a few days later and they got back the lung function. Luckily, the, the arterial and the vascular uh, venous components were not damaged, only the bronchial component was damaged. And they were able to reset the, uh, they were able to revive the lung after a, uh, uh, anastomosis. Uh, if you've got a membranous, large membranous uh, injury, it's a very large injury, then you can go posteriorly a long posterior lateral thoracotomy and a primary repair of that with a muscle flap on it. This is a very nice paper on management of laryngotracheal trauma. Excellent. It's one of the best papers I've read. 
And it talks about many techniques, but I just highlighted the ones that are of importance to you. And so primary repair with a muscle cost uh, is there. Sometimes they, they, they've spoken about a tracheo esophageal transaction, secondary to sword injuries and things like that. And in that, you first repair the trachea, uh, first repair the esophagus, put a muscle flap across the esophagus, and then you repair the trachea. And always you have to leave a long, uh, you have to leave a tracheostomy tube. Uh, and you've got to put in a chin stitch to allow uh, the healing of the trachea, okay? All right, uh, penetrating pulmonary, we spoke about uh, pneumothorax, hemothorax, chest strain is all that you need in all of these. Most of the times you manage them conservatively, but if chest tube is more than 1.5 liters, more than 250 ml per hour, you need to explore, okay? So always keep your uh, uh, sensors up, uh, be ready to explore. And I, I do them by VATS, I'm quite happy unless I'm expecting a supra major, something like that, I always start with a camera and go in and wash out and then see what is happening. And most of the time I've managed to get away with just vats rather than exploring. Uh, great vessels, if you've got a penetrating injury, most die, uh, prone thoracotomy, manual tamponade, cardiopulmonary bypass, deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, but now endovascular stent graft may be an option, okay? So all of this is self-explanatory. I don't need to go into more details of this. Uh, it's what we've discussed. Uh, these are penetrating cardiac are very bad, significant cause of death. Gunshot is worse than stab injury. Okay, stab injury is a, is a clean cut. Gun stop, a, a gunshot is always a very ragged cut. So you may not get the uh, control of that bleeding. Usually you just intubate them, do an anterolateral thoracotomy or a clamshell. I have personally done clamshells for about four or five cardiac uh, injuries. And uh, you, you go in there, open cardiac massage. You have nothing to lose. The guy is going to die. So you go in there, you start open cardiac massage. One finger presses on the area that is bleeding. And then you take a large uh, needle with a, uh, with a stitch on it and then go below your uh, finger and usually try to put a pledget on it and come back on the other side and get a, a horizontal uh, mattress sort of compression for that thing. Uh, so, so you repair it. Many of the times you manage to repair it. Sometimes you might have to uh, clamp the descending aorta to allow cerebral perfusion. These patients are dying in front of you. So you just take an artery versus clamp the descending aorta so that the blood goes to the brain preferentially over the abdomen and thing. Gives you enough time to put a stitch on that one little incision on the heart. And we have actually managed to salvage the patients that we have operated on. Uh, but the problem is by the time they, they die before they come to you. So any pericardial effusion uh, with, a, with a stab injury should be explored. You cannot treat pericardial effusion with stab or penetrating injury conservatively, never. You should always explore it. Again, uh, any uh, stabs below nipple line, should, you should think about diaphragm. The key with diaphragm is even if it's a small injury, you must repair it because a small injury very quickly becomes a big injury. I go in by VATS, uh, you can go in by laparoscopy, uh, depending upon what is the uh, pathology that's happening. Again, with esophagus, the same philosophy. If you recognize it, then repair it. If you don't recognize it, it's got very poor outcomes. Uh, and usually you might have to wash out and do things like that and put in a stent and NG and NJ feeding tubes, okay? Air embolism is a problem with trauma. Uh, usually if the patient's got hemoptysis with frothy air leak, you have to do urgent thoracotomy. You have to clamp the hilum of the lung, uh, head down position, open cardiac massage, and then take a needle and a syringe. You might even have to go and bypass, then take a needle and aspirate the LV apex. I've done this two times actually, and you've got to really work hard to save these guys. But they do come out if you understood that there is air embolism happening. The key thing is having a high index of suspicion and then you might be able to save it. Don't forget iatrogenic injuries, okay? In, in penetrating chest injuries and trauma, in the exam, when you write about it, always write about iatrogenic injuries, chest tubes, okay? Subcutaneous, intraparenchymal, intrafissural, you name it, I've seen them. Liver, diaphragm, left ventricle, right ventricle, spleen, stomach. I have salvaged every single one of these situations. Each one of this is a patient behind the statement that I'm making. Uh, NG tubes can go anywhere. They can go into the uh, airway and they can cause pneumothorax. They can cause, I've had somebody who had an NG tube put into the 
uh, airway. It went through the airway, through the bronchus, through the tertiary bronchus, and ended up into the pleura. And the person who actually put it in didn't realize it and started NG feed. And then we started getting NG feed in the chest vein. In fact, this was in Plymouth, so uh, in Derryford. So <laughs> Shilpa might know or might not know. But we got uh, NG feed in the chest tube. That is when we realized that, bam, whoever has put in the NG tube actually has put it into the pleura. So not a good thing to do. Uh, central lines can cause injuries. Uh, they can cause hemothorax, pneumothorax, and you treat them according to the requirement. Uh, there are many complications of traumas. You must know them. Uh, atelectasis, ARDS, pneumonia, infarction, lung abscess. Everything is self-explanatory. I don't need to go through each one of them but they are all pretty uh, standard complications which you should be able to reproduce. Within the pleural space, empyema is a big problem, bronchopleural fistula, organized hemothorax, chylothorax, fibrothorax, and diaphragmatic hernias. These are all uh, known complications of pleural space in uh, trauma. Vascular complications are thromboembolism, air embolism, pseudoaneurysms, and great vessel fistula. Um, each one of them is possible because of injury. And uh, this is something that you must be able to reproduce when we discuss a CT scan. Uh, within the chest wall, you can get hernias or you can get persistent pain. With fractured ribs, you can get hernias. I've repaired a few uh, many years down the road. Uh, and of course, pain is always an issue. Within the mediastinum, you have a risk of infection and you have a risk of pericarditis. Uh, Watt syndrome, last few slides, definitely indicated. I use it quite aggressively. It depends on your level of experience. The indications are ongoing thoracic hemorrhage, retained hemothorax, persistent pneumothorax, when I want to know where the air leak is coming from. In diaphragmatic injuries, I'll go in by VATS and I will repair it primarily or I'll put in uh, some other uh, methods. Cardiac tamponade, if you want to do a pericardial window, you can do it by VATS, and usually in a slow tamponade. Thoracic duct injuries, where you can do thoracic duct ligation. I've done that in a couple of traumas. Post-trauma empyema, to drain the empyemas, and to remove all sorts of foreign bodies that are there within the chest. So VATS definitely has a role. Uh, VATS drainage of hemothorax, we've done VATS drain removal of bullet, VATS removal of foreign bodies, VATS removal of lost drains, tubes, you name it, and we've done it. Uh, very often, the, I, I take out bullets from the chest wall, because these people have subsequent have also got uh, neurological injuries and they need uh, subsequent MRIs. And when the foreign body is within the chest wall, you cannot do an MRI. So that for me is an indication. I, I have had at least three patients from Iraq and Afghanistan who have come to me uh, with paraplegia, para, with paraplegia, and I have done a, a you know I made a small incision and created a balloon underneath the tissue. Uh, put in a balloon underneath the tissue and created a space and followed the space up to the bullet and purely using the VATS technique, I've managed to take out bullets uh, in these patients. Uh, there are certain contraindications for VATS. Not everybody should jump in. I mean, for patients unstable, just open the chest. Uh, cardiac injuries, great vessel injuries, inability to tolerate single lung, inability to put him in a lateral position, coagulopathy and prior thoracotomy. These are relative. The last, thoracotomy never stops me. A prior thoracotomy I'm quite comfortable to go in and do a VAX, but some people may not be. Uh, it is important to rehabilitate these patients, diaphragmatic breathing exercises, coughing exercises, intermittent pressure breathing, quite important, secretion mobilization techniques like chest wall percussion, chest wall vibration, and incentive spirometer. So every effort should be made to recuperate the patient and to get good outcomes uh, in trauma. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry Thank it you, was sir. a very long lecture, but it was I think it is something that should be covered. If I'm doing it, I might as well do the whole thing. Certainly, sir. Did it purely for exam going. You know all these answers, but it is important that everything is there in one place and then we can treat it. Okay, come on, guys. Any question answers you want to ask? 7.30, two and a half hours, not bad, huh? Bad for a fasting man. <laughs> Question answers. Come on. It's trauma to you. <laughs> no trauma. I'm all right. I, I rather do it <laughs> than not do it. <laughs> no. Good. <laughs> yeah. Okay.
questions. Anybody has specific questions uh, you want to ask? Did it make sense what I said? Was it worth doing a trauma lecture? Definitely, sir. Definitely. We are going to see trauma from a new angle now. So you you think you learned something new in this? Uh, definitely, sir. Definitely. Definitely. Because I tried to cover everything, you know, so that everything is there in one place. So now all you have to do is to refer to this recording, and everything will be clear to you. Okay. Any specific questions you want to ask me, guys? You can ask me. Uh, I'm okay. There are questions in the chat, sir. Okay. Let's yeah. Yes, there are questions. Can somebody read it, Silpa? Just yes, sir. Read there is one question. Yeah, yeah because yes, read now. Yeah, I'm feeling very tired. I can't. Think. Can you can you please? I'm audio. Can you please comment on the importance of tractotomy in bullet yeah. injuries, whether a it what? is a must or not? Tractotomy in bullet injuries. What is tractotomy? Thoracotomy. It's written tractotomy. Thoracotomy. And, uh, no, no. Uh, it could be thoracotomy. Whether whether, no, whether you have tractotomy is uh, tractotomy along is the bullet. A very bullet old uh, tractotomy. It's along the bullet tract. Along the bullet it's... tract. Exploring the bullet tract. Actually, okay. that's not a good idea. You should you should go with the fresh incision. Fresh incision. You should go with the fresh incision. You should not follow the bullet track because you will actually cause more damage. The bullet might be sitting, uh, causing a a compression on a blood vessel. So it's not a good idea to follow the bullet track. You must actually, if you do need to get into the chest to follow the bullet, come in with a new incision. Come in with vats if you like, but don't follow the track. You'll cause more Im infection. Not a good Excuse idea. Me, yeah. Uh, this question was by Fitun. Yeah. Fitun. Yeah. I I had to sign out actually. I just sign in now. Uh, so for tractotomy, I mean, like if you have a bullet injury causing massive hemothorax and you have to open, like there's indication for like emergency thoracotomy, and when you open, there is um, the only source of bleeding is from the bullet tract. So oh, some would different. say, that, that, yeah. That is different. That is different situation. That is a different situation. You don't follow the bullet track normally. You you do the thoracotomy. You open okay. the chest, wash okay. it out, have a good look, and make sure there is nothing else bleeding. Once you're sure that nothing else is bleeding, then you follow the bullet track. You will see the IMA bleeding, or you will see the intercostal bleeding, and that is okay. That I understand. So would you actually open like put an, for example, you can see the yeah, yeah. and yeah, through the that. lung parenchyma. You have to put an artery open and sew over everything. Is that no, correct? Usually, Nowadays, no, 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 usually you do it to the chest wall. The tractotomy. Yeah, I'm talking about the, the lung wall, parenchyma, not the but chest. But if it's on the lung parenchyma, you lift it up and take it away. Take away what? You lift it up and staple it out. That's what I do. I, I don't try to follow the tract into the into the pulmonary uh, parenchyma because you will cause a major bleed, which okay. you will not be able to control, and you might end up with a lobectomy. So you okay. just lift it up, lift the bullet in your parenchyma, and staple the wedge it out. That's what we do. Uh, okay. You, you and try if there is no bullet follow left the track. Otherwise, yeah. at the depths you might encounter one big vessel and you might tear it. So don't follow the tract in the parenchyma. In the chest wall, you follow the track, but in the parenchyma, you don't. You staple it out, bring the whole track out. Can you just like, um, like capitonage or just pair string the inlet and outlet and that's it, or that's not correct? You, you can do all these things. It depends on what's happening there. Most of okay. the times, pulmonary contusions don't need surgical resection. Okay. If it's just a contusion that you're worried about, that the bullet has gone through and through, and come out on the other side, then that contusion you don't follow. You just leave it, it will heal. Put a couple of stitches on the top and the bottom and it will heal. But uh, if you have to take a bullet out at the end of the track, then lift the whole thing up and wedge it out with the bullet and come out. If it's gone through and through, you don't have to worry. It usually heals. It will heal, okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, usually how... heals. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, how about, I don't know if yeah. you mentioned uh -huh. it, thoracotomy for subclavian artery injury? Yeah, yeah, you can. Everything is needed, whatever is the access. It depends on where exactly is the injury. I just showed them a bullet injury which with a bullet lying on the subclavian artery. I made an incision on the, on the chest wall or in fact, I followed the track with a camera to the bullet and I took it out. Uh, but but you've got to be ready for the problem with subclavian is through a thoracotomy, the access is very poor with a subclavian artery. It's very difficult to to reach mm -hmm. the subclavian artery because what you need is proximal and distal control whenever you're doing with these. So I would rather go supraclavicular access. 
I have once done a transclavicular access. I have made an incision across, cut open the uh, clavicle, opened it up yes. to get access yeah. proximal and distal so that I can clamp it. My philosophy is proximal control, distal control. That is the main thing. That is what will save the life of the patient. So don't be in a rush to take out the foreign body. Always yeah. proximal control, distal control. So in one situation, I have actually cut the clavicle and put it all wide open so that we, in trauma, you're saving life. It doesn't matter. So, you know, yeah. whatever incision you take, it doesn't matter. You just have to do what you have to do. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Come, come because what was the next uh, question? Uh, yeah. Yeah good, yeah. yeah. good evening, sir. I am Rajat. Can I? Yeah. Hi, Rajat. Hi. Yeah, hello, sir. Sir, nice, very nice talk, sir. Sir, I have a few specific questions. First of all, uh, when we see few patients who have multiple rib fractures, but they don't have any pneumothorax or hemothorax. Hmm. So, should they manage conservatively or should we prophylactically put in a chest tube? If there is no hemo or pneumothorax, I don't put in chest tubes. Okay, because, sir, in such few patients I have seen, after two or three days, they developed hemothorax because there is a then you put slow in bleeding it. from intercostal artery. Then you then put it then in only two, two days later. But 95% of them will get away without a chest tube. So, a slow bleed you can manage. And sir, uh, but I don't electively put it. I have to have an indication for chest tube. Okay, I have to have an indication. So, I don't put in a chest tube. Many times I've got people with fracture in. In the UK, it is one of the indications by admitting patients. Uh, some hospitals do that, and uh, you don't uh, put in chest tubes into everybody. You just leave. It. And two days later, if he gets a collection, you put in a chest tube, or you put in a cell digger, or whatever is needed. Fine. Fine. And sir, so sometimes you get uh, multiple risk factors associated with the factor. So it is—is is it an indication to fix it right away, or we can wait? Multiple rib fractures with sternal fracture. Again, if the patient is stable and there is no yes. uh, there is no hemodynamic compromise, I have made sure that there is no cardiac injury uh, and patient's pain is well controlled. I don't see a need to fix it. Fixation of ribs and sternum are, are, are all possible. You can do everything. It's not a problem with it. You can go in and fix any single fracture. You can you know put wires and all. My experience has been many of the times, uh, it's not the fracture which causes them long-term problem. It is your thoracotomy which causes them long-term problem. So I, I'd rather that uh, it heals by itself. Nature is the best healer. So if I don't, I have specific indications for rib fixation and for sternal fixation. And I said that the four indications for rib fixation, if the patient doesn't uh, yes. fit into that, I will not fix it. For sternal fixations, again, I need to be sure it's really not compromising the heart. Sternums by themselves heal, you know, so it's not a big problem. If it's a displaced fracture, and I'm worried that in future it will cause cardiac injury, then I will fix it. See, fixing it is not a big deal, Rajat. In fact, it needs more experience to know when not to do it. Yes, sir. It definitely, you need, you got to be very careful no. and to choose that your intervention doesn't cause more problems. That is the problem with this situation. So it, it completely depends on what is happening with the patient. And if the patient insists, then you have to do it. That's that's the biggest one. That if the patient says, I want it fixed, then you fix it. Then you have no choice. Okay. Fine, sir. And sir, lastly, if you have a, yeah, yeah, sir, lastly, uh, if you have a penetrating cardiac trauma, so it has to be explored with a cardiopulmonary bypass standby or you can explore without it also. Oh, always standby. Always, I, I'll tell you. Because I work in cardiothoracic units. Always tell uh, For me, having a, 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 a cardiopulmonary bypass is, is no this thing. But I'll tell you, if you have it bypass, if you have it standby, my philosophy in life is, if you have anything standby, you never need it. It's only when you don't have it standby is when you need it and then shit hits the roof <laughs> and you don't know what the hell to do. There is no time to prime the <laughs> bypass machine and things like that. So I always have things standby. I will all whenever I'm doing a media stenoscopy, I have a sternal saw standby always, as a rule. When I'm doing wax, I have an open thoracotomy set standby always. So you don't have to search for things, and you you know one patient if you lose in a career of 40 years because you were stupid enough not to have and something standby is not worth it. So I always would keep standby. 
but of course it depends on your center your center may not have uh, cpb available uh, then you have to make an assessment what will it yeah, do so sir then are we medical <laughs> medical legal <laughs> are you covered then medical legally to 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 handle cardiac injuries you should not you send it to a center which has got uh, medical legal sir yeah medical legally you are not covered man if the patient dies then what do you do but trauma is a very safe area i'll tell you why Fine. because the patient was going to die anyways <laughs> so whatever you do it was a plus point but if somebody raises an issue then you are in trouble but most of the times in trauma you know the patient is going to die somebody with a stab through the heart is got uh, less than 5% <coughs> so whatever you do to save his life is worth it i know of an anesthetist who went out with the ambulance team and he was he had a uh, the son had stabbed the father through the heart and the anesthetist in the bedroom did a anterior thoracotomy and took a silk stitch and put it through and tied it and then brought the patient to us and actually the patient lived <laughs> i am telling you so nothing to lose but uh, the pre hospital <laughs> management is very important we in the uk they train them very well in pre hospital management so that is why they are able to save lives in india the problem is the pre hospital the ambulance guy doesn't know even how to put in a vent flow really they are not true paramedics are they they are just bus drivers really so that, that is the problem the system is not there okay next question yes thank you thank you yeah thanks someone has asked is there any role of subcutaneous drain in traumatic severe subcutaneous oh. emphysema i i i have put this as one of the questions i need to address there is no role for subcutaneous drainage of surgical emphysema zero never making these multiple incisions putting in needles putting in subcutaneous emphysema are all meant to make the surgeon feel better they have no role or no impact on clinical outcomes the treatment of surgical emphysema is treat the cause and drain the pleura so if you've got a chest drain and you've got increasing emphysema you're probably a chest drain is not properly placed put in a second chest drain i don't mind that but putting in subcutaneous uh, chest drains makes no difference i promise you this it looks awful surgical emphysema looks awful to the patient but it is never malignant never malignant it always resolves in a few days once you have treated the underlying cause so to put cuts on the chest wall and put needles <clears throat> it's not there in any guidelines i promise you all the literature we looked at it's not there it is just practiced by old surgeons who feel that they are doing something for the patient uh, but i think it is meant to make the surgeon feel better not to make the patient feel better because you are increasing the risk of infections etc etc not indicated at all Okay. Next question. Yeah. In the chat, there are no other questions, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. If somebody's got a question, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, Somebody has written questions. something now. Just hold on. Okay. Sir, so for, for cardiothoracic surgeons, is it necessary to get license to do echo, for example, EFAST? And if so, where can one get the training and certification? Uh, ANTS they will teach. Yeah, AT, ATLS is the ATLS. Is, yeah, ATLS is the is the platform. It is actually mandatory for you to know uh, how to do ultrasound. Ultrasound is a very good tool, and you can use it for the for uh, the chest. Uh, and and EFAST, you you have to have uh, training for it. So ATLS actually is it's the, it's part of the ATLS guidelines. So you will learn it there. If you go to a good ATLS course, you will learn it there. It is mandatory. Okay, all right. Was it worth covering this topic? Uh, I just wonder. Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. Definitely 100%. worth it. Hundred percent. Yeah. Of course. Because a lot of it is common sense, but a lot of it is protocolized, and you need to understand how yeah. to deal with it. And and what all I'm trying to do slides. is, yeah, every slide is actually uh, every slide is one question is and trauma, one answer. Is trauma asked in the FRCS exam? Yes, yes. Okay. I was asked, how will you remove the long question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. On the table, on the table, I was asked. I have one question. Sir. I had a long question on pulmonary tracheotomy. 
Yeah. One minute, let me just stop the yeah. recording because now we are just chatting. Oh, sorry, yes. Recording stopped. Okay. Uh, now tell me. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Sir, this is Abha. One second. One yes. Minute. One minute. Just, just wait one second. Uh, my AirPod. The recording is stopped. Yeah. Okay. Talk. Uh, good evening, sir. Sir, this is Abha. I have one question. Actually, two questions, sir. One is similar to what Dr. Rajat had asked. Uh, whether going by median sternotomy is a better idea in a, a suspected cardiac uh, injury or whether anterior uh, thoracotomy is better in view that we might require CPV? Clamshell. Clamshell, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It really depends on where is the injury, Abba. It depends on where is the injury. It's completely, uh, my decision to do an anterior thoracotomy or sternotomy is dependent on where is the injury. Most of the time, things are lateral. Right. And anterior and sternotomy may not give you access. Uh, whereas if you've done an anterior thoracotomy, you can easily cut across the sternum and convert it into a clamshell. No, no, I have not. done it in two or three times. When I have used a scissor, scissor in an a &E to convert a bilateral thoracotomy into a clamshell because it was just such an emergency. We didn't have a saw ready, so I actually just cut across with the scissor, opened the... Did what I to add to that question, sir, hmm. what are the things I will not be able to tackle with a standard for me? Because we open it daily, so yeah, we feel more comfortable. comfortable. <laughs> exactly. I have been faced, I have gone through the standard for me. See, the problem is uh, with a sternotomy, you can still go laterally by making uh, it into a T incision. T incision, so, you know, yes, sir. You, you make a sternotomy, go laterally, make a hemiclamps. Hemiclamps. Yes. So it's not that sternotomy will not give you access. It's just that you have to extend the incision into a lateral T incision. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, sir, uh, iota, the descending iota is not well approached. Left subclavian cannot be well approached. The hilum cannot be well approached. Uh, you know, peripheral lung tissue cannot be well approached. Distal things cannot. The thoracic outlet is very poorly approached uh, with sternotomy. So, if I have to do that, I just put in a lateral cut across like that. And so you have got to. You just, then you just open it up like. A, I, I I one day I will do a talk for you guys on thoracic incisions, mm, and yes, we can discuss all of that in there. There are. So one more question. Uh, you uh, mentioned uh, serial. Uh, what, is, what was the next question? Sir, the question is, sir, uh, you mentioned serial, serial ABGs, sir. Your voice is gone. Sir, can you hear me? She is asking. She is asking. You've mentioned serial ABGs. No. Hello. Voice is audible, sir. Your ear audible. Gone on to Voice is audible. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, go on, go on. Tell me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Abba, you were asking something. I, I still can't hear. Something wrong with me. Earpod is discharged. Oh, Abha, is, Abha is muted. No, no. Now Abha's voice is not audible. <laughs> <laughs> My voice. She, voice. she, she is asking about serial ABGs. How frequently we need to do. Yeah. Depends on the condition of the patient. Sometimes you do every 10 minutes actually. <laughs> it really depends on the condition. Yeah. Of the patient. So mm -hmm. if, if, if the patient is not responding, we have, we have gone into the CPR mode and we are resuscitating, then we do every 10 minutes. So there is no guideline for that. You have to do what is needed at that time. But serial ABGs do play a role. Uh, they, they must be done. I'll tell you this, this talk, which I've just done, is, is a complete talk on, on trauma. You, you, if you keep it as your guide and go back to it, you will not need to need, need to read any other textbook. I, I have I, read, I personally went through about four textbooks and I went through many uh, I went through ICU textbooks as well to find out everything that is there. So this will cover everything. Uh -huh. For a surgeon, definitely I don't think you need to know anything more than this. Uh, I wrote five pages. I have gotten locked out, sir. Yeah, yeah. Your so, que your question has been answered in absence, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My question was how frequent do we have to do serial ABGs? Depending on upon the, depending upon the clinical condition of the patient. <laughs> so you may have to do it every 10 minutes or may have to do it once an hour. It depends on okay. the very fast. Okay. There's no standardized answer for no, There is no standardized answer. Right. That's, that was my because if you're in an arrest scenario, we do it every 10 minutes. So. It completely depends on how the patient is responding to your treatment. All right.
fine thank you very much guys i hope it was worth it and uh, tomorrow i think babu ko like tropical yes sir tropical thoracic surgery tropical thoracic surgery yeah saturday mm-hmm. i have two lectures uh, i i uh, rajan santosham had already booked for uh, 9:30 for okay. tracheal injuries uh, sorry trachea trachea uh, injury of the trachea but uh, i managed to get uh, uh, akif turna and he is going to talk about tumor immunology oh. wow wow <laughs> <laughs> hot topic again hot topic very hot topic yeah. very hot topic so i said you do it i want you to do it and yeah. so he is going to do it at 3 o'clock on saturday so uh, 3 3 uk time okay mm. and at 5 o'clock okay. rajan so even if it clashes with some cardiac lecture it's okay we'll still record it as long as some of you guys log in i can conduct the course definitely sir yeah. sure sir 3 o'clock 3 pm is tumor immunology immunobiology and 5 o'clock on saturday rajan sampresham on surgery of i'm so happy to see this program very soon the phase of our Managed for all of thoracic surgery. I think there's nothing left now. Very few topics left. Uh, 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 Harish is going to talk on uh, on post-operative complications in thoracic surgery patients. And then Sunday, I think uh, uh, Doctor. Oh God, my brain is not working. Uh, H.S. Bedi, sir. Uh, Doctor Bedi is talking about mm. neuroendocrine. Arsino. Saturday you have told about neuroendocrine tumor. Sunday. Sunday, Sunday neuroendocrine. So let yeah. me let me clarify now. Um, Friday is Babat Pash Biswas for uh, for tropical thoracic surgery. Yes, 5 sir. Five p.m. GMT. Saturday three p.m. GMT is uh, Akif Turna for uh, tumor immunology. Mm. Yes, sir. Five o'clock is uh, Ajahn Santosham for trachea surgery of the trachea. and then sunday 5 pm gmt is uh, arinda bedi for sleeve resection for carcinoma and then harish has not given me a date but we'll fix this time uh sub two questions so when are you um, so when are you planning to take shilpa ah shilpa yeah tell me so when are you planning to take statistics and audit preparing for that still time right I mean, please uh, tell us in like four five no, days no, advance. Lecture probably will be statistics. I am just. Uh, I've already. If if I share my desktop, you'll see the the lecture is already ready on my desktop. But I'm. So please tell us in advance so that we are prepared actually because. You can never be prepared for statistics. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> no, we are totally blank. I mean, otherwise you'll have to feed <laughs> everything in our brain. <laughs> I think early next week. I'll- Okay, and sec- mm-hmm. secondly, are you uh, coaching? Not coaching. Are you a part of any FEBTS aspiring students? FEBTS. I am not no. part of any 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 group. I am part of thoracic guru. I can't. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> While going through cardiac, I I, I you just had. You have no idea how much effort it takes to make these lectures. I understand, but it takes efforts <laughs> for us also to read. <laughs> Three days it's taken me to prepare this one part. Okay, so I can't individually do groups now. I will just do. You know, can I have a question? Yeah, certainly. For any other questions, you can always uh, write to me. But uh, I, I, it's not possible for me to take uh, individual groups or uh, responsibility for people. That, that's a bit. I, I don't want to say group like this. Okay. But uh, once the lockdown goes down, I'll be able to plan a bit more about uh, about face to face stuff. I have no idea. I don't know how to do. You could have taken some review course in UK. I would have like come in, you know, you know, some cardiac thoracic review course. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you very much.